symposium that uh, prior to the pandemic, uh, we were we were holding each fall in person. So these are strange times for us, but uh, we didn't want to be discouraged in terms of uh, of making sure that uh, uh, St. Mike's again became at least uh, a center of attention for at least one day uh, in uh, in the autumn. Um, before I begin, and although we're on very different uh, pieces of the earth, um, I'd like to acknowledge um, that the land on which the University of St. Michael's College operates uh, for thousands of years uh, has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Um, today, this meeting place is still the home to many Indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island, and I and we are grateful to have the opportunity uh, to work uh, on this land. And so um, this morning, I'm going to make my remarks very brief. My name is Mark McGowan. I am the interim uh, principal and vice president of the University of St. Michael's College. And for many of you, uh, you're thinking he's just a bad penny that has returned uh, to this job because I served uh, from 2002 to 2011 uh, in this role. So it's a little bit like Groundhog Day, but it's always uh, a pleasure uh, to be in Celtic studies, to be with my colleagues and uh, for have them and others in the discipline share with with you some of the, the recent research. And I must say, um, we have uh, an impressive array uh, of speakers uh, this morning uh, and this afternoon uh, for you with, uh, with breaks in between, knowing full well that we have to get up and stretch and, and do a variety of, uh, of things that are necessary, uh, even in online conferences. Um, the, the whole idea of this was eventually, was, initially to be in person. And uh, of course, because of COVID-19, um, we, we, we backtracked from in-person to hybrid now to, to Zoom. Um, and in fact, it was during the sessions by Dara Gannon, who was our Beacon uh, uh, scholar uh, this, this past year, uh, that uh, David Wilson and others hatched the idea of having a conference uh, that situated Canada within this uh, decade of, of centennials that is being experienced by, by Ireland right now. And so we have speakers this, today from Montreal, uh, Dara himself from Ireland, um, uh, Padre Gauchil from, from, from Halifax, uh, and uh, others from the Toronto area uh, to address Canada's uh, uh, appearance uh, within uh, the, the history of this decade uh, of centennials. So uh, I would also like to thank a number of people, uh, both at the college uh, and uh, away from the college, uh, who have helped make this possible today. Um, we could never do anything in Celtic studies without uh, the work of Jean Tallman, who is definitely uh, the person who gets the word out, um, uh, addresses the, the needs uh, of any conference, whether it be online uh, or in person. Uh, Sheila Eaton, who has done all the design work uh, in preparation for the conference so that Jean can send things out um, that are uh, artistically pleasing, uh, informative. Uh, and uh, I'd also like to thank uh, Natalie Bar uh, Barbuzzi, who you can see uh, on the call. She is, uh, she is our savior in behind the scenes on, on the Zoom call. She's my executive assistant uh, in, the, in the principal's office. But I think one of the secrets that you may not know about Natalie Barbuzzi, particularly the Irish community in Toronto, is that despite her Italian last name, Okay, she is actually uh, the granddaughter of Patrick Rooney, who was the founder of the, the Emerald Isle Seniors Association, uh, the former president of uh, the County Down uh, uh, Association, uh, and very active in the Irish community of Toronto. He himself was a native of Hilltown uh, in County Down. So, so it's all come full circle, Natalie, for you as, uh, as uh, you unexpectedly arrive in my office and then suddenly are really uh, among old friends, and particularly old friends of uh, your grandparents, Patrick uh, and Betty. Um, I'd like to thank the University of St. Michael's College for, for helping host this event. Now in the chat, uh, I've actually placed the next event uh, as, a, as a plug. Uh, Irish Ambassador to Can uh, Canada, Eamon uh, McKee, will be speaking to us on the 28th, which is this coming week. Uh, and I have posted in the chat uh, the, the title of the talk of War and Peace Stories from, Northern, from the Northern Ireland Peace Process. Uh, and he'll be in conversation uh, on, uh, on 
at 6 uh, p.m. on uh, Thursday, October the 28th. So uh, you're more than welcome. This is a free event, and it's be now become a bit of a tradition since Eamon arrived that he, he does a, a talk uh, at St. Mike's uh, in the fall. So the, the address there is uh, USMC Principal's Office at utoronto.ca, and you're, you're more than welcome uh, to attend uh, this event. Um, I'd also like to say that there's just a couple of ground rules uh, for today. Uh, please keep your microphones muted uh, unless asked to do otherwise. Um, that way we don't, uh, uh, we don't have the speakers disturbed by, by other sounds. And there are you know, many people on this call right now. Uh, and the second is, is that during the Q&A, uh, if you could actually put your questions in the chat and uh, David Wilson, the convener, uh, will uh, we'll, uh, read those out uh, for the speaker. And uh, that way we're not speaking over one another on Zoom and uh, it, uh, uh, it makes for a, a much smoother uh, Q&A session. Uh, and uh, other than that, uh, thank you very much. And I'm going to turn now the sessions over to the conference convener, my colleague and friend, uh, Dr. David Wilson. Thank you very much, Mark. And um, I'd just like to say, first of all, how great it is to see not quite so many familiar faces because most of the screens uh, are uh, blank, but so many familiar names. Um, so uh, welcome to all of those of you who are here for the first time and welcome to old friends. Uh, we're delighted uh, to know that you're, you're with us today. Um, some of you will, uh, will have heard the talks that our first speaker gave uh, when he was Ireland Canada University Foundation, Darcy McGee Beacon Fellow at St. Michael's College. Uh, they were very good indeed, very stimulating, very stimulating and we're delighted to have him back. Um, Dara is a, a lecturer in Irish studies at University College Dublin and the author of Proclaiming a Republic, Ireland 1916, and the National Collection, also of Conflict, Diaspora and Empire, Irish Nationalism in Great Britain, 1912 to 1922, and with Fergal McGarry, Ireland, 1922, Independence, Partition, Civil War, which is coming out next year for the centenary. His next book is already well underway, uh, Worlds of Revolution, Ireland's Global Moment, 1919 to 23. Dara has established himself as one of the world's leading authorities on the Irish diaspora and the Irish revolution. And as such is exceptionally well-placed to talk on rewriting Ireland across the globe, Robert Lindsay Crawford, Canada and the Irish revolution. Dara Gannon, over to you. Thank you so much, David, for that very warm welcome and your generous uh, you know, introductory remarks. And I'm so grateful to be here with you this afternoon in Ireland, this morning in Canada, and to thank everyone for, for taking the first part of the weekend to spend this time with us. Again, I'd like to express my thanks and appreciation to, to David, to Mark for convening this really stimulating and I believe wide ranging conference um, on Canada biography and, and the Irish uh, Revolution. And again, to extend my thanks to the uh, faculty and the administrative um, team at St. Michael's College. Um, as was mentioned, I was privileged to be ICOF Beacon Fellow, Darcy McGee Beacon Fellow at St. Mike's earlier this year, um, albeit digitally. And I think that speaks to the possibilities of kind of um, uh, generating these transatlantic and transnational discussions um, about Irish Ireland's past, present and future. And I very much hope and believe that today will be um, intrinsic to, to uh, continuing those conversations. Um, so today I'm going to talk about Robert uh, Lindsay Crawford, um, who was at once a journalist, a diplomat, uh, a public figure, a public intellectual. He moved from being an orange man to an Irish nationalist, um, from a, a journalist to a, a representative of the Irish free state. But before I do, I think it's important to offer some introductory remarks about the idea of um, uh, rewriting Ireland across the globe. And as David mentioned, this was part of my um, Beacon lectures, which I delivered in the spring, this idea of thinking outside of this 
island narrative. Um, so where in the world was the Irish Revolution? A century after the historical facts, the geography of the Irish Revolution remains open to debate. The dramatic series of political events known as the Irish Revolution, comprising Ulster Crisis, First World War, Easter Rising, 1918 General Election, War of Independence, Partition and Civil War, have traditionally been understood as an island story. The Irish Revolution, by such a reading, was denoted by successive nationalist, political and military campaigns to secure Ireland's independence beyond the British Empire. The establishment of the Irish Free State and Northern Ireland polities respectively within the British Empire ultimately brought the revolutionary period to a constitutional conclusion. The historical narrative of the Irish Revolution by this geographical interpretation was the story of Ireland, North and South. However, as Enda Delaney and Fergal McGarry have recently observed, quote, to frame this event as taking place solely within Ireland flattens out the complexity of this global revolutionary moment and privileges the political entity that later became the independent Irish state. Such an approach would impose ahistorical boundaries which few contemporaries would have recognised or understood, unquote. And I'm arguing in this presentation that Robert Lindsay Crawford was one such contemporary figure. But before we speak about him, a short note on biography and biographical approach. Um, the, the, uh, the precedence of, of biography has perhaps been diminished within the historiographical literature in recent years. There has been a view, for example, that biography is the preserve of white, middle and upper class uh, and does not allow for a more capacious intellectual framework. However, in the spaces of transnational and global history, biography has been one of the most effective ways to transcend those ahistorical boundaries, which I refer to, and pursue transnational history uh, with the view that ideas are always located. And this, is, of course, has been demonstrated no, no, uh, no, uh, um, in, no better, um, in no, no better a case than our uh, master ceremonies today in his work. So in terms of Robert Lindsay Crawford, um, he has been a figure who has attracted attention from biographers um, to, to a certain extent, but has not been the subject of a sustained biography and certainly not on the global scale. John W. Boyle in 1971 published an article in the Canadian Historical Review, a Fenian Protestant in Canada, Robert Lindsay Crawford, 1910 to 1922. And Crawford has indeed featured in histories of the Irish in Canada more broadly, such as Robert uh, McLaughlin's Irish-Canadian Conflict and Patrick Mannion's A Land of Dreams. Um, it should be noted that uh, Robert Lindsay Crawford was the subject of an entry in the Dictionary of Irish Biography by Porrick Dempsey and Sean Boylan in 2009. And this was then uh, reprinted in the uh, publication Irish or Ulster Political Lives in 2011. But I was very mindful in preparing today's presentation of the words of James Nicholson, the founding father, if you will, of the Dictionary of Canadian Biography, when he gave his intellectual uh, reasons for the idea of the bio Biographical Dictionary of Canada. He stated, quote, the object shall not be only to supply an acknowledged want in Canadian literature, but it should compete with or even surpass works of a similar character produced elsewhere, unquote. So in today's presentation, as I outlined the uh, global lives of Robert Lindsay Crawford, I hope to um, offer an alternative and expanded vision or version of the existing biographical content uh, which exists in the historiography. And this is rooted essentially in the research which I undertook as part of the Arts and Humanities Research Council funded a global history of Irish revolution project between 2017 and 2021, which allowed me to explore archives, not only in places like Belfast and Dublin, but also in New York, Washington, Melbourne, and through the generous support of the Ireland Canada University Foundation, the digital resources of the University of Toronto. So I hope that those um, multiple perspectives, those global perspectives will inform our, our presentation today of Robert Lindsay Crawford. 
So Robert Lindsay Crawford was born on the 1st of October 1868 in Lisburn, just outside of Belfast in County Antrim. He was the son of James Crawford, a scripture reader, and Matilda Crawford, née Hastings. Um, so educated privately, he began work as a businessman, but soon moved into the work of uh, journalism and politics. He was the founding editor between 1901 and 1906 of the Evangelical Irish Protestant Newspaper and the Associated Independent Loyal Orange Institution of Ireland, or the IOL for short. And this had been a breakaway from the Orange Order um, in uh, 1902 on the basis of um, a, a critical or critique of the Orange Order uh, in which the IOL suggested that there should be a more socially radical and egalitarian philosophy underpinning uh, unionism, certainly in Ulster. And Crawford was one of the most vocal um, and the most literate uh, representations uh, and most visible representations of that critique in the early 20th century in Belfast and in Dublin. Um, so Crawford uh, was an extensive uh, political orator uh, uh, and writer, and perhaps his most famous work, um, the work which gained him certainly the, uh, the attentions of contemporary nationalists and unionists, was the uh, Matramore Manifesto, published first in July 1905. And in this manifesto, he described unionism as a discredited political creed, he called for an end to the Protestant Catholic strife and also the binary way in which people thought about um, the Irish question in that regard. He argued for the elimination of clerical influence in Irish political life and the recognition by all Irishmen of a common nationality. Now this uh, manifesto uh, got him in, in a degree of trouble with the Ulster Unionist Council, um, who saw this as a radical breakaway from the established orthodoxy of Ulster Unionism. Um, comparisons were made, for example, with Theobald Wolfe Tone, and there was a sense that this would be a stepping stone, if you would pardon the expression, to uh, a, a more Republican or, or, or extremist um, position. Um, and subsequently, uh, um, he was um, uh, removed from the editorship of the Irish Protestant in May of 1906 on account of those radical views. But it's interesting the extent to which uh, those views uh, informed ideas, more ecumenical ideas, if you will, um, uh, of what the Irish nation could be even in the early 20th century. So Michael Davitt, the leader of the Land League, in private letters, he praised the manifesto and in fact offered to pay for the manifesto to be issued in a pamphlet form. But I would also suggest in regards to uh, exploring the legacy of Robert Lindsay Crawford that we look towards the later 20th century as well. And it's remarkable in the later Troubles period from the 19, late 1960s, how many Southern uh, nationalist newspapers evoked the memories of uh, Crawford's uh, Mullock Moore Manifesto um, for the purposes of trying to establish a, a reformed unionism. So for example, the Irish press, which of course was de Valera's own newspaper, uh, on the 5th of May, 1976 stated, quote, the Macromore Manifesto was a remarkable document to emanate from an orange institution. Had Lindsay Crawford had his way, the independent orange order at one time equal in size to the orange order might've become a major or perhaps the major body of influence in the Protestant community, unquote. So looking at the long 20th century in, in, in those terms, we see a resonance certainly for uh, Lindsay Crawford's ideas and the, uh, the promise which someone of his stature um, offered to Irish nationalists certainly um, moving forward. Um, from uh, 1910, uh, Lindsay Crawford, Robert Lindsay Crawford moved to Canada. So on account of his uh, uh, trenchant critique of Ulster unionism, he was unable to find employment in Ireland. What's also noteworthy in terms of the research which I've been doing in archives in Britain is that he was offered opportunities uh, to take up journalistic positions at, in Fleet Street uh, in London. Um, but he was told that he would, quote, have to write down his country, unquote. And he refused those offers from leading London dailies on the basis that 
uh, he said to a friend, quote, I need scarcely say, say I preferred to starve, unquote. And starve, metaphorically, he almost did. Uh, in some of my research in New York, I've come across a letter from Robert Lindsay Crawford to John Devoy, leader of Clan Nagale and the kind of arch fenian of his day. And Lindsay Crawford, almost destitute, having emigrated following his um, dismissal, is offering to sell copies of his articles from the independent Orange Order days to uh, John Devoy. And I quote, I came here from Ireland about a month ago to retrieve my broken fortunes, but up to the present moment, I have not been successful in obtaining employment, unquote. Uh, and that was from uh, June of 1910. Um, now, Nonetheless, Lindsay Crawford was resolute, certainly in his political beliefs, but also his belief that he would secure employment moving forward in Canada. Um, and he did indeed secure a post on the editorial staff of the Toronto Globe uh, from 1910. But it's interesting the extent to which he maintained communication with uh, his literary uh, peers within Ireland, notwithstanding his political contemporaries. So he corresponded regularly with Francis Sheehy Skeffington, that noted uh, suffragist, who of course uh, would die tragically during the 1916 riot rising. He, uh, they corresponded on issues regarding home rule, the suffragette movement, and also the latest scholarship emerging from Ireland, such as the work of Tom Kettle. Skeffington, who was a great admirer of Lindsay Crawford, referred to him as the Ulster Moses, perhaps the idea of leading Ulster Unionists, uh, you know, through the, through the desert of, uh, of sectarianism. Uh, Crawford himself would write in December of 1910 to Sir Wilfrid Laurier, the uh, Prime Minister of Canada and the leader of the Liberal government, describing himself as an Irishman resident in Canada. Now, of course, he'd only been in Toronto for a number of months, but I think that Irish res Irishman resident in Canada uh, designation is interesting because as we will see, that self epithet will change over the course of his life. Um, now, what's remarkable, of course, is that Lindsay Crawford uh, goes back to Ireland to cover in extensive detail the Ulster crisis, which had emerged between 1912 and 1914, whereby Ulster Unionists opposed at first uh, politically signing the Ulster Covenant uh, and then militarily establishing the Ulster Volunteer Force, the establishment of a Home Rule Parliament in Dublin, believing that this uh, Home Rule Parliament would mean Rome rule in Ireland and that they would be subjected to the dictates of the Vatican. Between April and early July 1914, at the height of the so-called Ulster Crisis, uh, Lindsay Crawford sent back 60 dispatches to Canada through the uh, Toronto Globe. Um, and it's quite interesting to look at the, 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 the various genres in which he wrote or rewrote the, the history of the Ulster Crisis uh, for those readers back in Toronto. And um, so in some respects, he was presenting himself as the kind of investigative journalist or man on the ground. Uh, he writes on the 6th of April of 1914, at Curracamp, Ireland, feeling among the troops widespread, unquote. That was in response to the Curran mutiny. Um, he, he later wrote July 1914, uh, a night in the British House of Commons. This idea that he's on the spot uh, and establishing authenticity journalistically. Um, he also was uh, establishing his bona fides or credentials as both a nationalist commentator and a unionist commentator. So, for example, he's very uh, willing to express how close he is or explain how close he is to the main political operators. Um, he rather uh, he he rather clearly demonstrated this in his uh, editorial or his piece on the fourth of May, nineteen fourteen. Quote. Sir Horace Plunkett reminded me in the course of an interview that the question of Irish home rule has been simplified by its disassociation from other issues, notably that of the land. And he followed one month later on the 5th of May, 1914, I am in a position to state on the highest authority that Churchill's recent speech in the Commons brought an ultimatum from the Irish leader, that being John Redmond, who immediately informed Premier Asquith that the government must go on or go out. So again, establishing that he is in the know, that the, the, um, the uh, unionist and nationalist credentials that he has built up from his time in Belfast and Dublin through his writings are um, giving him a unique access or insight um, to this period of the Ulster crisis. 
He would also offer very colorful anecdotes uh, about life in Ireland, uh, remarking, quote, gun running has supplanted cattle driving as the national pastime of Ireland. I won't comment on that, of course. Um, but I think it's important to recognize the intellectual uh, basis on which Lindsay Crawford spoke with such authority. And again, through his writings in the early 20th century, he had emphasized that the nature of the division between North and South, between Catholic and Protestant, between Ulster and the rest of Ireland was indeed an economic issue uh, rather than a purely sectarian one. And he writes in April of 1914, quote, the Irish question is mainly an economic one. Ireland on the whole must remain an economic uh, unit. Exclusion is impracticable. And this is something which distinguished him certainly from the, uh, the wealth of commentators, certainly from the London press who saw the issue of, of Ulster and um, partition and the Ulster crisis as a purely sectarian one. And this brought about um, some difficult comments from the uh, London Times co own correspondent in Toronto, who spoke of, quote, the Ulster news for Canada in, in response to Lindsay Crawford's uh, interpretation of these events. And in response to Lindsay Crawford's argument that uh, Carson was whipping up Ulster Union's businessmen to oppose home rule, um, uh, it, it, on the basis that this would um, preserve their um, uh, authority and hegemony in uh, uh, over a potential home rule settlement, the London Times correspondent in Toronto remarked, quote, this is the sort of stuff which comes in columns as a, quote unquote, faithful presentation of the conditions in Ulster in uh, the United States and Canada. So there is a belief, certainly in London circles and the London Times, that um, Lindsay Crawford is an influential commentator who is perhaps misinforming, in their view, the people of Canada as to what's happening on the ground in Toronto. This, of course, is challenged in the, the, the columns of the Globe itself. Um, and one letter to the editor in May of 1914 states, quote, the wisdom of sending Mr. Lindsay Crawford to Ireland to report on the Ulster crisis is, I think, by this time quite apparent to all. No other correspondent of any paper went to Ireland with such a fund of already acquired knowledge of modern events of character and of conditions in the old land. The invaluable nature of his dispatches is seen from the frantic endeavours of the Unionists in England to discredit them. No other correspondent has received so much attention. Um, so uh, Lindsay Crawford, again, is seen as someone of, who has influence, uh, it, certainly in um, uh, journalistic circles uh, during this period. And this will be put to the test, his, his ideas of Irish identity, but also Canadian identity during the First World War period. Um, so uh, Lindsay Crawford would, would speak uh, during the war uh, regarding the um, the... 1916 rising, and again, evoked this idea of a, an economic challenge, that the rising represented an economic challenge to the status quo, to the hegemony, hegemony of Ulster Unionists. Um, and, and in many ways, he was articulating some of the views of James Connolly in that respect, that this was a, a socialist rebellion um, rising up against the capitalist classes. Um, but perhaps more controversially still, Lindsay Crawford became an ex uh, increasingly um, critical exponent of the First World War in Canada uh, itself. Um, and he uh, addresses, for example, in, in um, a, a meeting in um, Montreal in February of 1918, in which he invokes his opposition to conscription, stating that conscription in Canada was a failure, that the union government was a failure, and that liberals who supported the union government now saw the errors of their ways. Now, Mark McGowan, in his um, imperious work, uh, The Imperial Irish, Canada's Irish Catholics, fight the Great War, 1914 to 1918, has uh, explained uh, in great nuance and complexity the issues surrounding conscription in Canada uh, during this period. But I would add that I think Crawford's uh, literary um, and journalistic credentials marked him as a threat to uh, the, um, the, the, the imposition of conscription, but also I should, mark, I should point out his uh, ability as an orator, which perhaps has not always been established in the um, 
in the existing historiography. Uh, again, through my look at the um, home rule crisis in the archives in Ireland, I noted a comment from John Redmond in which he described Lindsay Crawford as one of the five great Irish orators of the world. Again, something perhaps to be discussed later in the, uh, in the bar afterwards as to whether Lindsay Crawford actually makes that top five list of Irish orators of the day. Um, but certainly there was a belief in political circles in Canada that this was a potential threat. And I'm mindful in this respect of the potential comparative work which could be done in respect of Archbishop Daniel Mannix of Melbourne, who of course was a vocal opponent uh, of conscription in Australia and was denounced by the establishment there. And I have seen in my work in Melbourne, for example, Robert Lindsay Crawford's anti-conscription rhetoric being reprinted in Irish nationalist newspapers in Melbourne. So I think there's an interesting comparison potentially to be made there um, on those contemporary figures. Uh, nonetheless, in February of 1918, um, uh, Crawford was forced to resign from the Globe following his remarks regarding conscription. And he said uh, that this had been some time in coming. Quote, I had felt for some time past that this was bound to come. It was not a personal dispute between the Globe and myself, but one which goes to the root of the breach between liberalism and unionism. At another time and in another place, I shall take the opportunity to state more definitively the lines of cleavage between liberals like myself and old time liberal journals like the Toronto Globe. Now, during this period, uh, the summer of 1918, while the liberals are out of power, um, Lindsay Crawford is in fact approached by members of the Liberal Party to potentially stand in opposition to the new Provincial Minister of Education in the by-election to be held on the 19th of August. And he ultimately declines this opportunity to enter into Canadian politics formally for personal reasons. Um, but it's clear, I think, that he is intent on establishing a newspaper, um, that he's intent on maintaining a critique and an interest and engagement in Irish nationalist politics throughout that time. And true to form, uh, he establishes in July of 1918, The Statesman, a weekly liberal newspaper, which of course is a great supporter of Sir Wilfrid Laurier's opposition party. Um, and this ran for four years. He was a, a great admirer of Sir Wilfrid Laurier um, and later eulogized of him that he was, quote, the great apostle of national unity based on Canadian patriotism, unquote. Um, but it would not be long before Lindsay Crawford engaged in politics more formally and more explicitly. And that, of course, was in relation to the arising nationalist movement in the aftermath of the First World War. So from January 1919, we see the Sinn Féin movement, the legitimate or the political inheritors of the 1916 rising legacy, uh, establish Dáil Éireann, which was the alternative government of Ireland in January of that year, which formed a counter state to the British uh, government, uh, government's rule in Ireland during that time period. And it's quite interesting to note the extent to which Lindsay Crawford, again, someone who's not elected by the people of Ireland and was not a member of Dáil Éireann, and interestingly has not been commemorated with the same status uh, and the same gravitas as those who were, and um, the extent to which he was given positions of influence um, by leading Irish nationalists um, of the day. So, for example, by looking through the Eamon de Valera papers in UCD, you note that Robert Lindsay Crawford was uh, one of de Valera's most trusted lieutenants on his 18-month tour of the United States. Um, in the de Valera papers at UCD, we have a number of Lindsay Crawford's speeches archived um, and you know, maintained by De Valera, uh, aside De Valera's own remarks. And that gives us, a, gives us a remarkable sense in this transnational approach of how Irish nationalists and Canadian Irish nationalists spoke to each other in this kind of transnational dialectic, if you will. Um, so those papers are again at, at UCD archives. Um, in the National Archives in Washington, D.C., I also came across Lindsay Crawford's address to the Senate Committee on Foreign Affairs, uh, which took place on the 13th of December of 1919. He was uh, requested or invited to address the bill to provide for the salaries of a minister and councils to the Republic of Ireland. And in this respect, he was joined by over 400 Irish American nationalists to, again, try to pressurize the American establishment to recognize um, Dáil Éireann and the Irish Republic. 
But it's interesting to note the, com the comparative approach, which can be taken in this respect as well, between Irish American and, and Irish Canadians uh, in their arguments. So um, people like Daniel Cohalan, who was a major operator and a very close friend and associate of Lindsay Crawford, spoke uh, in his opposition to things like the League of Nations and spoke about America first in terms of this idea of um, supporting Irish nationalism. Crawford, however, uh, spoke in more egalitarian terms and spoke uh, in more liberal terms about the idea of Ulster not as a sectarian, but as an economic issue. And again, adv advanced the view that Protestant businessmen in Belfast had sought to maintain an artificial difference between North and South so as to rein in the radical tendencies of workers such as, um, such as that he had uh, explored before. Um, so I think there's an interesting difference and tension perhaps between Irish American and Irish Canadian rhetoric uh, presented you know, in the highest echelons of the American establishment um, at the Senate in, uh, in the winter of 1919. Uh, what's also significant, and I think this is for both historical and commemorative reasons, is that from the uh, winter of 1919, uh, Lindsay Crawford is one of a number of influential figures uh, invited to uh, join the Protestant Friends of Ireland, which was essentially an ancillary body of the Friends of Irish Freedom, the main nationalist uh, body in the United States, led by uh, Daniel Cohalan and John Devoy, both of whom I've mentioned before. But Lindsay Crawford was invited to speak on their platforms right across the United States, both because he was a Protestant, uh, had formerly been an orange man, had been born in Belfast or just outside Belfast, um, but also because of his, um, his oratorical ability, which I've mentioned, his ability to speak uh, in, in clear argument that he wasn't just espousing established principles of Irish nationalism. He, he, uh, is, he established the logic of, um, of, of Irish unity as opposed to the rhetoric of Irish unity. And this was very clearly established in the spring of 1920. So uh, months earlier, a seven-man Ulster delegation visited the United States, speaking at 24 cities in three months. And these delegates were essentially following Eamon de Valera in an attempt to present to American audiences the legitimacy of Ulster unionism and the idea of partition and the defeat ultimately of home rule for Ireland. However, um, Lindsay Crawford was an adept speaker who, as part of the uh, Protestant Friends of Ireland, literally followed this unionist group city by city across the United States in the spring of 1920, uh, rebuking their arguments and presenting it again in a very logical, argumentative case, the, the position for Irish unity as opposed to partition. I think this is very interesting because when we think about partition 100 years ago, we have to recall that the debates and discussions surrounding partition very often took place in private at a very high political level. So, for example, the Irish Convention, in which Irish nationalists and unionists met uh, in 1917 to decide on partition, took place in private at Trinity College Dublin and was not widely reported on uh, in the press. Similarly, similarly um, the issue of Ulster recurred during the Anglo-Irish Treaty negotiations, of which we are uh, marking the centenary at this moment. And again, the likes of Collins and Griffith would have negotiated the terms and conditions of partition and the future establishment of Ulster in private, away from the people. And thirdly, in 1925, the Boundary Commission uh, established the formal boundary between North and South in private, dictating to the people of of, of the island of Ireland, the extent to which Ulster or Northern Ireland uh, should be established separately to the free state. But I think what's remarkable is that Robert Lindsay Crawford is engaging in a very public debate with Ulster unionists on platforms across the United States and, and demonstrating in this sense that there was a conversation, there was a discourse uh, and dialogue 100 years ago. So I think those debates are perhaps have been the lost debates of, of this period um, which can be recreated and restored to any potential debate in 2021 regarding the issue of partition uh, uh, and centenary of same. And I made those very points in when I was invited to comment 
for the BBC on Thursday's um, contentious centenary service at Armagh, the difference between the private discussions regarding partition, which defined Irish public life 100 years ago, and the public discussions which Robert Lindsay Crawford engaged in in North America. Of course, as we will see, um, Audra Gushiel, I'm sure, will delineate this in more detail. Uh, Lindsay Crawford was one of the foremost figures in the self-determination for Ireland League of Canada and Newfoundland alongside Catherine Hughes. And he was uh, remarked upon as such by the Royal Canadian Mounted Police's Criminal Investigation Branch, who, quote, uh, called him the most uh, serious figure of the movement. In the first place, he is a Protestant in a body overwhelmingly Roman Catholic. And in the second place, he has shown great levity of purpose, unquote. And of course, he was to be elected as president of the uh, movement at the Ottawa Convention in uh, August of 1920. It was quite interesting, of course, following this is that he engages, as does Catherine Hughes, on an extensive uh, speaking tour across uh, Canada, um, most notably in the Maritimes in Newfoundland in November of 1920, to again present in a logical argument that sense the case against partition. Um, but what I think is remarkable is that alongside those Irish political positionings which he offers, he also offers a very different position about uh, on issues of Canadian identity. So, for example, he stated at the end of the Ottawa Convention, quote, too long have the Irish here been set at the throats of the French, and tonight we proclaim a lasting peace between these two races. If this convention had done nothing else, it has shown us that we are one, neither French nor Irish, but Canadian. And the rally would end with the singing of O Canada. So this very public pro proclamation of a Canadian identity, which is liberal, which is egalitarian, which is inclusive. Um, of course, not everyone would see Robert Lindsay Crawford in that light. On the 3rd of December 1920, for example, he spoke at Fredericton, New Brunswick, uh, in which he was disrupted by hecklers. And a number of days later in Moncton, um, he was attacked upon by 500 who attended the uh, event at Moncton City Hall, pelted with ice, punched in the head and kicked in the back and in the legs. And it was alleged by the Orange Order's Sentinel newspaper forced to kiss the Union Jack flag, a claim which he denied. Um, and again, at that same meeting, he declared in the very kind of liberal sense, quote, I am a Canadian citizen and everything Canadian citizenship implies. Is it seditious for a man to love his country? And is it seditious for him to call himself a Canadian, unquote? Um, members of the British Empire Alliance, however, denounced Crawford as disloyal throughout his tour. So this is still a very contentious issue. Um, now, as I move towards the end of, uh, of this presentation, I just wanted to make a note about his uh, later career beyond Canada, because I think it instructs our understanding of the, informs our understanding of the importance of biography to speak to wider issues pertaining to the Irish Revolution and how these kind of micro histories can be used to um, considerable effect. So Robert Lindsay Crawford was opposed to the constitution which emerged from the Anglo-Irish Treaty signed on the 6th of December of 1921 and the constitution came into effect in 1922. But at the same time, he saw the practical benefits uh, of the establishment of the Irish Free State. Most significantly, however, he was unimpressed with de Valera, his former colleague and good friend, de Valera's proposed alternative to the treaty entitled document number two. And he wrote to his friend, Daniel Cohalan in New York, quote, de Valera had better retire to his university work. His usefulness in any public capacity has gone. His alternative oath was very amateur and wholly impracticable, unquote. Of course, I don't subscribe to that division between university work and public life. Um, but I think it is interesting the extent to which Lindsay Crawford um, is seeing things differently from his position in Canada and is seeing the political bankruptcy of de Valera's alternative to the treaty. And again, it's remarkable how candid Lindsay Crawford is in his letters as preserved in the American Irish Historical Society archives to the likes of jo John Devoy and Daniel Cohalan. So again, there are different archival spaces in which we can capture different versions of Robert Lindsay Crawford throughout his career. Um, he also, again, advocated on behalf of um, the minority now of Irish Catholics in the partitioned Northern Ireland 
um, party. Uh, he sent a letter in June of 1922 to the Governor General in Canada, which was subsequently forwarded to the new Canadian Prime Minister, William Lyon Mackenzie King, quote, I respectfully request that you convey to the British government on behalf of the Irish race in Canada, the feeling of deep indignation, which has been aroused by the failure to afford protection to the Catholic minority in Belfast, which for three years has suffered barbarous persecution at the hands of forces maintained and paid for by the British government." Unquote. Now, Robert Lindsay Crawford, in closing, was considered, again, someone who was a steady pair of hands, responsible, but also ecumenical in his political views, certainly as it, regard, as it related to the new Irish Free State. Um, and he was appointed as trade consul by the Irish Free State uh, in, to the position in New York uh, in December of 1922. Um, and here he experienced the tensions of the um, ongoing Irish civil war up close and personal on his very first day as trade consul in December of 1922. Entering the premises on 109th uh, Nassau Street, Crawford and his emerging um, diplomatic team were confronted by Lawrence Ginnell and later Muriel McSweeney, the widow of Terence McSweeney, who claimed the office belonged to the government of the Irish Republic as opposed to the Irish Free State. Crawford and Ginnell, on opposing political sides, subsequently occupied opposing rooms on the 10th floor of office building um, in this uneasy truce, which again remarkably signified the ongoing tensions of the Irish Civil War in microcosm. And they worked for competing claimants to the authority of the Irish government across the same 10th floor in different offices. Ginnell and the putative Republican administration would ultimately be evicted from the premises by the New York Police Department one week later. But again, I think that this episode, which signifies both the, um, the, the faith and trust with which Robert Lindsay Crawford was um, uh, uh, acknowledged, um, was nonetheless uh, significant of the wider tensions and violence ultimately of the Irish Civil War, and Robert Lindsay Crawford would die in New York in 1945. So to conclude, David Wilson has commented astutely, quote, it is impossible to understand Irish Canadian history without understanding Irish Canadian nationalism, unquote. It is my hope that in this paper I have presented in a short period of time through the life of Robert Lindsay Crawford, not only the power of biography to denote uh, changing politics and changing political legacies in terms of the Irish Revolution, but the importance of Irish Canadian nationalism to informing debates regarding Ireland around the world. Key political ideas on the future legitimacy of Ireland, partition and Canada were discussed by uh, Robert Lindsay Crawford in the pages of The Globe, uh, The Statesman and in other publications. And figures such as Lindsay Crawford who was not elected as part of Dáil Éireann, nonetheless intervened successfully um, on behalf of uh, Catholics in, um, in Ulster and also nationalists in Ireland more broadly um, and were considered, in contemporary, considered integral by contemporaries to the development of political ideas um, at that time. And as such, I would argue that Robert Lindsay Crawford can be considered what I would term one of Ireland's global influencers. In his remapping of political ideas onto Irish, Canadian and American public discourse, Robert Lindsay Crawford, like many transnational revolutionaries, defined the world around them. Revolutionary worlds inter alia are not born, they are made. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Dara, for a very stimulating and indeed wide ranging uh, talk. Uh, and one which I think uh, testifies to the benefits of global archival research uh, from Australia to New York to papers in Ireland uh, to Canada itself. Um, thank you very much for, uh, for demonstrating that and the importance of interpreting uh, Robert Lindsay Crawford not simply from an Irish or Canadian perspective, but from an international transnational perspective. Um, any questions, please put them in the chat. We don't have very much time for uh, questions. So uh, the window of opportunity is limited. Um, I don't see any right now. Okay, we have uh, one from 
Sure. Well, okay. Superb presentation. Thank you, Dara. Yeah, agreed. <laughs> I have a question myself. If no one else is is coming in, I've got I've got uh, two or three, but um, um, I mean, pick one really, or, or one one is is um, is the transition uh, from the independent Orange Order uh, to uh, the Maharamor Man Manifesto, or the Maharamor Manifesto, rather. Um, and you can describe that, uh, and you do describe that, but do you have any sense of underlying motivation? Uh, what drove him uh, to move in that direction? And the second question also relates to his Ulster Protestant background. Um, yes, indeed, as you point out, he saw the uh, the conflict in Ireland essentially is an economic one. But how did he explain the uncomfortable fact that there was massive grassroots Ulster Protestant resistance to home rule? Did he think that Ulster Protestants, his, uh, his, his fellow countrymen were particularly susceptible to manipulation? Thank you, David, for those really um insightful questions they've, they've given me much to think about and I'll try and address both just in the spirit of, of uh, ecumenism. <laughs> um, I, I think that his, to address the second question first, I think he, he saw the the uh, issue of, of, of partition and, and the divisions between Catholics and Unionists as something which could be mediated, and this is a very contemporary issue, you know, mediated through the power of the press and the fact that basically um, you know, Ulster Unionist position was being misrepresented through the press. And of course, we have people like Carson who, you know, um, espouse this kind of cult of kind of Ulster Unionist leader and through his rhetoric on platforms, but also through the press in association with James Craig, um, established a very powerful narrative in, in the early 20th century, the height of the Ulster crisis, that this was a, an issue of home rule versus Rome rule, um, and that this was an existential question, essentially, for Ulster unionists. Um, I think that uh, in many ways, actually, it's we can, we can look upon Robert Lindsay Crawford as someone with great foresight, who, in a very prescient sense, has in many ways opened up doors to thinking about the issue of partition today. Because of course, if you look at things like the protocol in terms of Brexit, um, those are the economic, economic issues are driving the, the kind of rhetoric uh, and discussions at a very high political level, but also at a community level about where the line should be between North and South, about what it means to be British uh, and about, you know, uh, I suppose relations uh, intercommunal relations and relations between North and South. So I think he showed great foresight. He was a deep political thinker. Um, in terms of his kind of uh, guiding principles, uh, I'm not quite sure where this has come from. I have looked through, I should say, his papers and prony, which aren't that, um, uh, which aren't, you know, extensive. Um, uh, I, but I, I think there may have been an element of uh, his father's um, influence in terms of you know his father being um, a, a clergyman, and uh, you know urging him, I suppose, to kind of um, read deeply as a scripture reader to read deeply uh, about you know these issues. Um, I think certainly when he goes to Canada, there's an element of the block mobility thesis. Uh, his criticisms of Carson and Craig, for example, could well be explained partly by the fact that he'd been disowned by unionist politicians, that he'd been forced to migrate. And, and so on, notwithstanding the legitimate arguments that he put forward about the economic issues underpinning uh, unionist uh, you know, opposition to home rule. So there's certainly a, a personal journey that he goes on uh, as well as a political journey. Um, but I think also it could be said by virtue of being in Canada, that he had certain perspective that you know, distance allows for greater perspective on, on, on these issues, that he was not embroiled in the claustrophobic um, you know, publication uh, tensions which were arising in 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 Ulster itself. Okay, thank, thank you. We have um, some very good questions in the chat coming up. In theory, we're taking a break now. So what I what I suggest we actually do is that for those of you uh, who wish to stretch your legs and um, and get a cup of coffee or a cup of tea, by all means, do so. Uh, for those of you who would like to continue with the Q and A, we will go ahead uh, if that's okay with you, Dara, because there's some very good questions here that I. I think could be addressed. Absolutely, love to. 
Okay, so the first is from Shane Lynn. Uh, do you think Crawford's Protestantism and his orange unionist background was more of an asset or an obstacle to his Irish nationalist agitation in Canada? That is an excellent question because I think on paper, um, you know, if we are thinking back to this time period, uh, certainly post 1916, there was this uh, image of, of Sinn Féin being evidently Gaelic, uh, Catholic, uh, and quite conservative. Whereas I think, again, perhaps the fact that uh, Lindsay Crawford was operating in those diasporic circles, that there was greater space uh, and greater, he uh, was allowed to establish greater agency over ideas about what Ireland was. Um, if he'd been working in Dublin, I think he would have been more prescribed, certainly within the kind of the, the nationalist press of the day. In the United States and in Canada, there's greater li um, liberty to, to write more freely. Um, and I think in a, in a greater intellectual vein uh, about you know, what Ireland is and what Ireland could be. And so I think it was an asset for the nationalist movement of the day because he could speak to audiences, certainly in Canada, uh, he could speak their language. He could identify about, he could, uh, you know, reframe the Irish question in Canadian terms. Um, and even in terms of the United States, De Valera put great trust and confidence and faith in Crawford's ability to speak, certainly in the Deep South, to, um, you know, Protestant uh, communities, Methodist communities, and so on, uh, which, of course, De Valera, as the representation of this Irish Catholic nation, could not do with the same efficacy. So I think he was more of an asset, and that was really borne out by the fact that the Irish Free State invited him to become the first uh, trade consul in New York. Okay, thank you very much. You. Uh, from uh, from Porrigo Shiel, uh, to what extent did Lindsay Crawford's decision to take up the IFS job in New York suggest that he would never work again in Canada, that is, Irish activism alienated powers that be? Another excellent question, um, and I, I kind of, I, I suppose really I, I, I would put two parts to that. First of all, I think um, in terms of identity, he certainly identified as a Canadian citizen, I try, as I try to bring out in the presentation. At the end of this decade, if you look at this decade of centenaries in which, as a decade in which we think about how identities were negotiated, I think, as I remarked upon, he arrived in Toronto as an Irishman resident in Canada, in his own words. Uh, and yet by 1920, 21, he's speaking to Canadian audiences and self-identifying as a Canadian um, citizen. Um, however, politically, certainly in terms of Irish politics, I think he saw greatest advantage uh, in being in the United States, that uh, there is greater political capital to have a position in the United States, uh, certainly in terms of those circles like uh, Daniel Kohalan, John Devoy, who are close associates of uh, Crawford during this period. Um, and he may well, although the, 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 the records that I've consulted don't bear this out per se, but he may well have been hoping for, you know, further office in the, in the United States um, beyond the position which he was given. So I think he certainly identified as a Canadian citizen, uh, notwithstanding the criticism he received by some audiences and some commentators. But in terms of his career, uh, in terms of his political networking, I think the United States was um, his uh, preferred destination. Okay, thank you. I, I suspect that uh, that question from Podrick may relate to Catherine Hughes's uh, subsequent career, actually, and, uh, and her difficulties uh, in Canada. Uh, but we'll move to that one slightly uh, further on. Uh, from Michael Vance, uh, would the fact that it is now considered impractical and deeply unwise to reimpose a hard border on the island, despite Brexit, a vindication of Crawford's economic views? An excellent question. And again, I was mindful without using the B word uh, until very late in my uh, in the Q&A, in fact, I, you know, I was conscious even preparing today's presentation, how uh, resonant his um, views are in terms of framing the issue of the border and partition in economic terms. Um, I think in that respect, it is a vindication of Lin Robert, Robert Lindsay Crawford, not necessarily, again, that he foresaw, you know, the situation where partition um, would be debate in these terms 100 years hence, but that a vindication that, first of all, he was a, a, um, a writer of, of great acumen, who uh, was a political commentator with, you know, of great insight and who could basically 
uh, I suppose, uh, deconstruct Irish society from a unique vantage point. So I think that re uh, restores his political credentials, but also I think more broadly, and again, thinking about the importance of biography and looking at this case study, if you will, of Robert Lindsay Crawford uh, as speaking to wider issues of the Irish Revolution and commemoration of same, I think it restores the idea of intellectual history as being um, something which we should definitely think about going forward. There has been a view among Irish historians, Michael Laffin, Jim McFerrit, and others who've basically stated that post-1916 Irish nationalism was intellectually bankrupt in terms of um, the development of, of uh, acute uh, and rigorous and robust ideas about what the future of Ireland should look like, and that they essentially, um, you know, do, 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 uh, I suppose, the, um, they devolve to that Gaelic Catholic viewpoint. I think Robert Lindsay Crawford is a, a, a very eloquent re uh, rebuttal of that idea that there was no intellectual thought during the Irish Revolution. And the fact that he had traveled that political journey from Ireland to Canada to the United States, but also that journey of of, of, of ethnic identity from Ulster Protestant to uh, Canadian Irish nationalist, I think speaks to the possibilities of using biography to speak to intellectual history during this period. And I'm sure our other speakers today will attest to that as well. All right. Thank Wilson, you. Wilson, could I cut in here? I don't know how to use chat, but I'd like to ask a quick question. And that is, I recently read Mary McAleese's uh, memoir, and she seems to think very much like uh, Robert Lindsay Crawford. And yet in that very, very interesting book, she ne ne never mentions him once. Would she, be, would she have been ignorant of his role in history? That's it. Well, thank you for that question. I, I can't speak to, uh, uh, to President McAleese's um, knowledge or otherwise of Robert Lindsay Crawford. I know that she uh, graced uh, St. Michael College as the first Beacon Fellow as part of this program and spoke eloquently of some of those issues that you've uh, uh, raised. So I think it, it would be worthwhile even revisiting that lecture, which is available on the ICOF website, to see what she said in relation to this decade of centenaries. More broadly, I think Robert Lindsay Crawford has been underwritten in the historiographical, in the historical record. There is a DIB entry. Um, but again, that's shorn of some of the global archives which I've been presenting today. And again, uh, within the wider historiography, he is referred to um, within a number of books relating to Ir Irish Canada, the Irish in Canada, but he doesn't feature in the Irish Revolution. So it's my sincere hope that certainly by today's presentation and hopefully in terms of publication going forward, that I can do something to restore his ideas, if not his political career, to the historical record. I think you will succeed. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for that question. Thank you very much, Dara, uh, once again. Uh, we're going to take a short now five minute uh, break and then we will return with uh, Porrigo Shield. Thanks for getting us off to such a great start. Thank you. All right. We'll be back, back in five.
Hi, David. Can you see that PowerPoint? I can indeed. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That uh, for better or for worse, that's uh, uh, some. That's the way I decided to go. Okay. So, whenever, whenever you wish to proceed. All right. Thank you very much. Welcome back, everyone. And. Um, uh, I'm delighted to introduce Padraig O'Shiel, uh, the uh, Darcy McGee Chair of Irish Studies at St. Mary's University. It's funny how that name Darcy McGee gets thrown around a lot. I must look into that one of these days. Uh, from, from Derry, uh, Padraig has written extensively on Irish language theatre, literature and folklore, publishing numerous articles in Irish and English. Uh, he's written an Irish language biography of Pierish Baisley, the revolutionary poet and language activist who was out in 1916, who became the director of publicity for the IRA and who would wind up as a pro-treaty Sinn Féin TD. Porig's main English language work though, uh, his main work in English is a superb biography of Catherine Hughes, tracing her journey from a Canadian imperialist to an Irish revolutionary, another fascinating and unexpected trajectory. Um, and Catherine Hughes became a co-founder along with Robert Lindsay Crawford of the Self-Determination for Ireland League of Canada and Newfoundland. Please welcome Padraig O'Shiel. Hi, thank you very much for that, David, and uh, hello, everybody, and I really appreciate this opportunity uh, to participate in today's uh, conference and to talk about my research on Catherine Hughes. I want to tell you why I changed from a Canadian imperialist to Irish, a proper Irish person declared Catherine Hughes at the Friends of Irish Freedom Irish Race Convention in New York in 1918. Hughes was not merely seeking to explain why she had converted to the cause of Irish independence, but indicating that she was ready to place her talents at the service of that cause in the United States. And this was no mere idle talk. Subsequently, Hughes moved to the United States uh, in 1918 to work as an Irish Republican organizer, lobbyist and propagandist. Uh, she returned home in the summer of 1920 as organizer for the self-determination for Ireland League of Canada in Newfoundland and um, then headed off on missions to Australia and New Zealand in 1921 and France in 1922. In turn, Hughes's commitment to the vision of an independent Ireland dramatically transformed her own circumstances. She had been a political insider and prominent literary figure in Canada. In fact, she was as successful as any Canadian woman could be in the public realm in the era before female suffrage. But her pro-Irish independence activities turned her into a pariah. Before we look at the course of Hughes's career, let's just for a moment parse her statement. I want to tell you why. This suggests that she was about to provide a clear explanation for her transformation. I'll return to what she said presently, but there is a paucity of personal documentation, letters, diaries, etc., that fully explain the reason for Hughes's political conversion. The reference to being a Canadian imperialist demonstrates Hughes's own understanding of her earlier espousal of a version of Canadian nationalism in the latter part of the 19th and early 20th century. The Canadian imperialist worldview centered on the belief in the intrinsic virtues of the British Empire, but in reforming the governance of that empire to expand the Dominion's role in decision making, and amongst other things, the Canadian context, strengthening the country's ability economically and militarily to withstand threats of annexation by the United States. But Hughes had cast off that worldview and become Irish, a proper Irish person. Whatever about Canadian imperialism, any definition of Irishness is subjective. When Hughes spoke about herself as a proper Irish person, she was not drawing on a set of empirical uh, markers, but on her belief that she become what she considered to be the real deal, 
a supporter of an independent Gaelic Ireland. Hughes had explicitly rejected her former Canadian imperialist self, but implicit in that was a criticism of many of her fellow Irish Catholics in Canada, who from her perspective remained unenlightened. In October 1917, Hughes spoke about them. They are, as I was brought up to be, Irish Canadian conservatives and imperialists. She continued, they would feel hurt if I told them the truth about the profundity of their ignorance of Ireland. So I do not, but one must drop a few items before their eyes once in a while. Where Hughes contended that she was in the right, some might see self-righteousness. But throughout the various phases of her career, Hughes never lacked conviction in the causes she believed in. And she brought to these causes her energies and her energy and talents. These served her well in the earlier part of her career and they earned her recognition and success in Canada. When she demonstrated the self-same traits in pursuit of a cause not popular in Anglo-Canadian circles, these led to personal vituperation and political retribution. Catherine Hughes paid a personal cost for her Irish political activism during the Irish Revolution years. Her literary career was sabotaged. Ultimately, she turned her back on Canada and walked away. By the time of her premature death in New York in 1925 at age 49, only she would know if the price she had paid was worth it. Born at County Line, Prince Edward Island in 1876, Hughes was the granddaughter of Irish-born Catholics. Her family, the Hugheses from South Ulster and the O'Briens from Munster, brought together representatives of the two main Irish groupings in PEI. The O'Brien connection was the important one in shaping Hughes's early identity as PEI Irish Catholic and Canadian imperialist. Her uncle, Archbishop Cornelius O'Brien of Halifax, emphasized and personified service on behalf of the church. But he had temporal concerns as well. Hughes described the Arch Archbishop as being, and this is a quote, Irish, warmly Irish, steeped in the fine history and traditions of the old race. But she also said he was a thoroughly devoted British subject who had, quote, deep admiration for British rule. In other words, he was a Canadian imperialist. In fact, O'Brien was an officer of the Imperial Federation League and later on Nova Scotia president of the British Empire League. Hughes trained as a teacher in Charlottetown and left the island afterwards, spending five years working among the First Nations. From 1899 to 1902, she taught at St. Regis, now Aquasasne, a Catholic Mohawk reserve. One must resist the temptation to imagine that her experiences amongst the indigenous peoples caused her to recognize the similarities between the experience of some of the native Irish and the natives as colonized peoples. That was not the case at the time or even afterwards, once Hughes became an Irish activist. Nor was there any anti-imperialist agenda to her work amongst the natives. She was there to implement government assimilationist policy uplifting, elevating, civilizing are the code words used by Canadian officials and politicians at the time. Hughes fully supported that policy. In 1901, she founded the Catholic Indian Association to assist natives get work off reserve. Hughes stated, they will thus acquire the habits of the white man and the Indian problem will disappear because the Indians will have become Canadians. That's the end of quote. Hughes was a willing cog in the colonial wheel. By 1902, Hughes had moved into journalism and joined the Montreal Star. In 1904, she was a founding member of the Canadian Women's Press Club, the first association for Canadian professional women writers and journalists. Then she headed west to Edmonton in 1906. This is a photograph from North, uh, Northern Alberta. The Edmonton years, 1906 to 1913, were the longest spell that Hughes spent in one location as an adult. These were an amazingly fruitful period in her career. She worked first as a journalist with the Edmonton Bulletin. In 1908, she was appointed first provincial archivist of Alberta. 
uh, her 1909 diary of an early research trip into northern Alberta has been published in recent years, a really interesting uh, uh, work. Hughes also published two biographies, one of Archbishop O'Brien, her uncle, and a second about Father Albert Lacan, the famous missionary in Western Canada. Critics raved about the Black Voyage, Black Road Voyager, published in 1911. The New York Times declared, we dare swear that Miss Hughes has written a far more truthful and accurate biography than has been written for many a moon. Hughes was, sec was seconded from the provincial archives to become private secretary to the premier of Alberta, Arthur Sifton. She was the first woman to hold such a position in Canada. She was, uh, she was also active in Catholic voluntary efforts in 1912, she founded the Catholic Women's League of, of Edmonton, the first branch of a body only launched nationally in 1920. The main goal of the Edmonton League was to assist Catholic female immigrants. Hughes's story up to this point was one of upward professional mobility. Senior male figures such as Premier Sifton and Archbishop Legal of Edmonton were impressed by her ability. Intriguingly, however, at a time when many of Hughes's female press colleagues, such as Emily Murphy and Nellie McClung, were active in the push for suffrage, Hughes came out against female suffrage. The decision to leave Edmonton in 1913 to take up a position as administrator of the Office of the Agent General of Alberta in London proved a watershed in Hughes's life. She visited Ireland for the first time in the summer of 1914. In her Friends of Irish Freedom speech in New York in 1918, Hughes explained the impact of that trip. No matter how much we know of the old history of Ireland, we know nothing of the conditions in Ireland till we go there by ourselves. And when I was sent over there some few years ago and saw things for myself, I was appalled at the conditions. A country made up of the very old and the very young. There were few young people around, she claimed. Many of the young men had enlisted in the British Army and uh, all the young people had emigrated. And she continued, the very thing which started me out in this, the cause of Irish independence cause, was the sight of those desolate hearted, weary old Irish mothers, frequently without a child around them, all being overseas. But in fact, Hughes's explanation doesn't match what she told Albert Lacan in August, 1914, just as World, One, World War I was beginning. She had returned to Ireland, quote, from a pleasant trip in Ireland, the dear spot. And then she continued, the Irish people at home are not as rich as we are in Canada, but they are finer in many ways. Such fine courtesy of manner, warm hearts and unselfish ways. At Dublin, I had lunch and tea with Lady Aberdeen and His Excellency. Whatever about encountering those desolate hearted, weary old Irish mothers, Hughes found time to hobnob when she was in, in Dublin. His Excellency Aberdeen was the former Governor General of Canada and current Lord Lieutenant of Ireland. Bearing in mind her Friends of Irish Freedom audience in 1918, I, suggest, I would suggest that it suited Hughes to frame her conversion as one that happened as a direct result of her personal experiences in Canada. Instead, Hughes's radicalization started in London before her first trip to Ireland. The period 1913-1914, Dara was talking about earlier on, was an unsettled time and fascinated Hughes, a political animal. There was the drama of the Irish Home Rule Bill at Westminster. Ulster Unionists with the active support of Bonner Law, the New Brunswick-born leader of His Majesty's loyal or not so loyal opposition, sought to thwart the bill by whatever means necessary. The Ulster Volunteers pledged to resist Home Rule and started arming. Irish nationalists responded by founding the Irish Volunteers. 
Hughes saw played out events such as the Curra incident in March 1914, when senior army officers pledged to resign rather than uh, uh, rather than potentially face down unionist opposition to home rule, raising questions about the rule of law and the democratic process. The closer Hughes stood to the centre of power and empire in London, the more uneasy she became about the British government attitudes and policies towards Ireland. She wrote later, since my residence in England, I have every reason to know that the English democracy care nothing for Ireland, while the English oligarchy hates it. Moreover, Hughes had encountered Irish cultural activists in London. She befriended Padraig O'Connor, the most important writer in Irish in the first quarter of the 20th century, who was teaching Irish for the Gaelic League in London. Hughes and O'Connor collaborated in writing a play in English. O'Connor personified a radically different sort of Irishness, a Gaelic version of it, than the pro-empire variety Hughes knew in Canada. I suggest that Hughes was primed for political conversion by the time she visited Ireland. She attended and wrote about the Gaelic, Gaelic League's annual cultural festival in Killarney in August 1914. Styling herself Catchling the E, an Irish language version of her name, she spoke about how the wild geese, the Irish diaspora, could assist Ireland's progress and future. In effect, Catherine Hughes replaced her loyalty to the British Empire with devotion to a new empire, the Irish race. Hughes started writing a book about Irish affairs. She continued to move between different circles in London, the Irish nationalist expatriates on one side and the city's genteel society on the other. Amongst the latter was a visitor, the railway builder, Sir William Van Horn, who in a Canadian context was famous for overseeing the completion of the transcontinental railway line, memorialized and mythologized as the last spike. Van Horn had provided a preface to the Leconte biography and was clearly impressed by Hughes. No sooner had the two agreed that she would return to Canada to write several books on the Canadian Pacific Railway than Van Horn died. His son Benedict then commissioned Hughes to write his father's biography. Undoubtedly, from Hughes' perspective, that work would fasten her reputation as a heavyweight literary writer, no longer a mere Catholic author focusing on church worthies, but one who tackled the issue of a prominent civic figure. Back in Canada, Hughes toiled away at the Van Horn manuscript, she could have quietly forgotten about Ireland and concentrated on her literary career, but events intruded. 1916 has shaken me out of a good deal of lazy fare, she wrote in October 1916, referring to the Easter Rising and its aftermath, including the executions. She completed a short book, Ireland, uh, which the Canadian Freeman, a Catholic newspaper in Kingston, Ontario, published in 1917. The book's argument for Irish independence was not based on emotional or romantic grounds, but in a recent presentation citing dry facts and figures, including economic and trading data. In 1917, Hughes's views on Ireland were still evolving. She was not yet an Irish Republican. That would come later as she followed the lead of the first Doyle Aaron in January 19th uh, and viewing the proclamation and the Easter Rising as the foundational events of the Irish Republic. Nevertheless, the censor in Canada sought to ban Hughes's book Ireland, despite its far from extremist tone. And when that failed, he confiscated, apparently without legal authority, multiple copies of the American edition. From 1917 onwards, Hughes's so Hughes started giving occasional lectures in Canada about conditions in Ireland and writing to the newspapers. And she looked around to see how she could assist the independence movement. At the 19, 1918 Irish Race Convention in New York, she met Daniel Cohalan of the Friends of Irish Freedom and, quote, asked the privilege of myself coming to work 
where there was a field worth working in, end quote. Clearly, Hughes recognized that Canada did not rate as a viable field for activism at that time. Once Hughes submitted a draft of her Van Horn biography to the family, she moved to the United States to become a full-time activist for the Irish cause. She first worked with the Irish Progressive League, a small but active outfit in New York City, but in late 1918 moved to Washington DC to run a press office and lobbying unit that would provide information about events in Ireland for politicians and newspapers. The following year after the Irish Progressive League federated with Friends of Irish Freedom, the, the, the major Irish political um, umbrella organization, Hughes began working officially for the Friends of Irish Freedom. Drawing on her years and experiences as organizer, administrator and writer, Hughes drafted a comprehensive blueprint for a professional national pro-Irish propaganda, propaganda campaign in the United States. In the two madly busy years that she spent based in, in, in Washington, Hughes worked with Kohalan and recent Irish expatriates like Harry Boland. And she got to know Eamon de Valera, who was touring the United States, lobbying for American recognition of Ireland's right to self-determination. Hughes' publicity and propaganda-related activities during those two years make an impressive list. But Hughes lost out in the internal political disputes me, and uh, within the pro-Irish network in the United States, not least of all because she was a woman in a male-led movement. Hughes hoped that the Friends of Irish Freedom would select her as director of its propaganda centre in DC that was modelled on her own blueprint. Instead, a man got the job. In addition, she found herself drawn into the nasty dispute between De Valera on one side, Cohalan, Devoy and their allies on the other, but control the Friends of Irish Freedom. Hughes sided with De Valera. Increasingly, Hughes spent more time um, doing field work. She did the advance work for De Valera's tour of the Southern States in spring 1920. Hughes launched and, re launched and reorganized branches of the Friends of Irish Freedom in Tennessee, Georgia, Alabama, and Louisiana. Hughes also compiled one of the volumes in a propaganda series published by the Friends, English Atrocities in Ireland, banned in Canada, needless to say. In the summer of 1920, on De Valera's orders, Hughes returned home to launch a new organization, the Self-Determination for Ireland League of Canada in Newfoundland. As, uh, as Dara was talking about earlier on to, uh, this morning, Lindsay Crawford was the public face of the League and was elected president. But it was Hughes, using the model of the Friends of, of Irish Freedom, who established branches of the League from Halifax to Vancouver and back eastwards to St. John's uh, in, uh, in Newfoundland. So during the summer and into the early autumn of 1920. As the summer turned to autumn, Hughes was tailed by watchful detectives and dogged by infuriated orangemen who protested at her meetings. When she was organizing in Western Canada, the Iron Sentinel described her as one of the greatest troublemakers in the West. Hughes was present in Ottawa in October 1920 for the first national convention of the Self-Determination League. She was hailed as, quote, the woman who had, who had done more than any other for the cause of Ireland and Canada, end quote. But with the League established in Crawford in command, De Valera had a new mission for Hughes to establish sister leagues in Australia and New Zealand. But before she headed uh, to, uh, to, to, to Down Under in early 1921, there was an occurrence that illustrates the price that Hughes paid for her commitment uh, to the Irish cause. After Hughes had submitted her draft biography to the Van Horn family, uh, Benedict Van Horn, Sir William's son, gave Hughes's manuscript to Walter Vaughan, uh, a family friend, and uh, in order to edit it. He only ever was editor, but when the book appeared in late 1920, Vaughan was credited as sole editor. 
Hughes was convinced that Benedict Van Horn and his circle, who were hostile to Irish independence, were extracting their revenge on her. Hughes wrote, excuse me, Hughes wrote, um, I learned from the best possible authority in New York that Mr. Van Horn did strongly object to my political views and open advocacy of Ireland's cause. Not surprisingly, Hughes was furious and threatened to sue both Van Horn and the publisher. The reality was, however, that she didn't have the finances for a court case. In the meantime, she couldn't delay her travel to Australia. Hughes established the Self-Determination League networks in Australia and New Zealand in the first half of 1921. No sooner had she completed that mission than De Valera appointed her to organize the Irish World Race Congress set to be held in Paris in January 1922. This was meant to be a major diplomatic and propaganda showcase at which representatives of Ireland and her diaspora would assemble in support of the Irish Republic. But by the time that the Irish World Race Congress opened in late January 1922, Doyle Aaron had ratified the Anglo-Irish Treaty, fueling the split that would result in civil war in Ireland six months later. Attendance was minimal at best due to the changed situation in Ireland, and though Congress decided to launch a new organisation to unite the diaspora, named Fine Gael, not to be confused with the later political party, Fine Gael didn't survive the fracturing in the, in the Irish independence movement. Hughes was strongly anti-treaty. She returned not to Canada, but to the United States after the Irish World Race, World Race Congress. Presumably she realized that she wouldn't be welcomed to, or, find, uh, or find employment back in Canada. The break with Canada was not just physical, but psychological. As you can see there on the screen in 1922, she applied to be naturalized in the United States. And she described herself in 1924 as a once upon a time Canadian. Though in declining health due to cancer, she launched new campaigns. She sought to collect money from Irish Americans to establish her old friend, Patrick O'Connor, as a writer of residence at University College Galway. She founded a small organization in New York called Nagia Nathena, the Wild Geese, which tried to unite former colleagues on opposite sides of the treaty split. Hughes, who never married, died in the Bronx, New York, in April 1925. Her role in the Gay and the Fianna meant that Hughes fell foul of her Irish Republican comrades in New York and led to their staying away from her funeral. The Irish Carmelite Peter McGuinness, who was in New York, described her funeral as remarkable for the number absent from it. To this day, her grave in, New in St. Raymond's Cemetery in the Bronx remains unmarked. Though interestingly enough, and I just sort of include this at the last moment, recently the PEI Irish have unveiled a, a memorial to Hughes. Finally, how to assess Hughes. The change of direction of her life from Canadian political insider and literary figure to political dissident was dramatic and unexpected. Hughes, the Irish Republican activist, was not representative of majority opinion within the Canadian-born Irish Catholic community. However, there was a minority, including some Irish-born immigrants, who shared her radicalism during the Irish Revolution years. For me, the importance of her story is how it illustrates that broad stroke portrayals of the Canadian Irish may miss and gloss over the presence and significance of dissidents such as Catherine Hughes. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Paul. I guess I, I, I was very struck by, uh, uh, by your final comments and about her break from uh, Canada, which was, as you say, psychological as well as physical. And it seems in some sense that was symptomatic. Uh, of, of uh, the degree to which um, her views were the exception among Irish Canadian Catholics. In a similar fashion, I suspect, um, uh, to the way in which um, Lindsay Crawford's views uh, were, um, were very different from those of most of Ulster Protestants. In fact, that's clearly the case. 
Uh, so uh, with both Lindsay Crawford and Catherine Hughes, we're dealing with uh, with figures who um, who switch their views from the Orange Order to uh, the Self Determination League, or from Canadian Imperialist to the Self Determination League, uh, but who fail to carry their their co religionists with them. Fair, fair, fair comparison. Absolutely, absolutely, no doubt about that. And in that sense, well, I suppose that a much abused word, but Hughes is a bit of an outlier, kind of in the, in the context. Um, she is a woman who's big into causes, and you can sort of see this diving in in a way. Uh, she's able to convince herself, and a lot of this is based on her reading. So, the, so again, I think this little book that comes out in 1917, which I, I've never really kind of come across any great, any any significant discussion of it, I think is very important. It's very dry, but in a way, that's what's important. She's not making an emotional case. Uh, yes, she's describing herself as somebody kind of of Gaelic stock. And again, this is part of her, her own personal change from Gaelic stock from the North and the South, the Hugheses and the O'Briens, but she's marshalling facts and figures to support her case. One can agree with them or disagree with them, but it's a somewhat different uh, 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 approach than just sort of, if you like, appealing to emotions or any kind of romantic sense. I think Hughes is, is quite significant. Uh, for that, perhaps not a million miles removed from the sort of intellectual stuff that uh, that Dara was talking earlier on in the context of uh, uh, of uh, Lindsay Crawford. Uh, thank you. Uh, we'll open this up for a question. So by all means, uh, put your uh, questions in the chat. We've got uh, a good uh, 15 minutes uh, for questions. So plenty of breathing space here. So please feel free. Uh, while I'm waiting for uh, chat questions, um, I, I would, I would say your 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 reference to the book Ireland 1917 is very interesting. I've encountered that myself in the uh, in the secret police archives, you know, the Bureau of Military Police, um, and it's also very interesting to me that it was published by the Canadian Freedom, a Catholic, uh, sorry, the the Canadian Freeman, the Catholic mainstream Catholic newspaper. Uh, what do you make of that? Um, well. It comes out before uh, before conscription in Canada. So, but it's interesting when you look at Mark's work on uh, on the Imperial Irish uh, and attitudes towards something like conscription. Uh, he would see the um, the Canadian or the the, the Canadian Freeman in Kingston and the Northwest Review in Winnipeg as having somewhat different perspectives on uh, on Irish matters been perhaps more nationalist. And again, I don't want to try to put more, but that's certainly my reading of what, uh, uh, of, uh, uh, of what Marx, Mark's presentation, that they were more nationalist than, uh, than perhaps, or more Irish nationalist than, than some of the other uh, uh, um, Anglophone Catholic newspapers. So, uh, again, it's interesting just how they, uh, how she, op or the little sort of, I suppose dedication almost or whatever at the start of the book she's saying the proceeds from this book are going to uh, Skull Eina which of course is uh, St Enda's uh, the, the uh, college the school founded by Patrick Pierce uh, in Dublin so again uh, yes I'm interested by the fact that um, that the Canadian uh, Freeman took on this but I suspect it does reflect that it's a little bit more nationalist by that stage than many other newspapers. But right. the other thing, of course, is that Hughes had these Catholic connections as well. And you don't know where these kind of uh, play into it. Uh, I'm not necessarily sure that's the case in the context of, um, of, uh, of the Canadian Freeman in that book. But one of the big sort of almost like support systems that Hughes had across the country was this network of Prince Edward Island clergy. And a lot of these people were in senior positions uh, at different stage, didn't necessarily accept her views, but there were, there were family and sort of local sort of connections that I think are important. All right. Thank you, Paru. Uh, Mark has just uh, put in a comment confirming uh, 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 your view there. The Canadian Freeman was somewhat 
of an outlier to uh, other Catholic newspapers. Um, David, could I just sort of jump in there? Yeah, just to, and Padre, you're right. I mean, it, uh, the, the Freeman probably was more disposed uh, towards a more radical position in Ireland. But what's really equally as interesting about the Freeman is its area of circulation was predominantly Eastern Ontario uh, and Montreal. And that gives you a, a sense of, of the readership of the Freeman. And the only unfortunate archival footnote is that the only extent copy of the Freeman right now is rotting in a vault in the Episcopal Palace uh, in the uh, Archdiocese of Kingston. So um, uh, it desperately needs to be salvaged because I think it really is an important source. And uh, in terms of the networking of the bishops, this was a time, you're quite right, Padraig, when actually PEI and Antigonish uh, clergy were now populating dioceses across the west of Canada. So very important network there. That's thank, it. Thank, thank you, Mark. Uh, uh, I'll return to the, uh, to the chat uh, questions. And uh, the first one is from Shane Lynn. Did Hughes ever revise her earlier position on the treatment of First Nations peoples following her radicalization? I don't believe that she did. And in some ways, part of the problem is that she moved so far, far away from that kind of area, that time and place in her career, that it's not obvious that she did. Uh, there, she, towards the, the final years of her life, she was, she was continuing to write material that was ne has never been published, a number of plays. And there are sort of some inklings, for example, she describes herself as being kind of adopted into two Indian nations. So she retains a certain amount of interest and is drawn on a certain amount of that material. But I do not believe, or there certainly the, isn't the clear evidence to suggest that she made a firm connection between uh, the Irish, the Irish experience of colonization and the, 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 the native experience uh, in the new world. Not that I can see. If it's there, I may have missed it. Uh, 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 if it's there, I've missed it. Right. Uh, thank you. This from uh, Sheila Reeser. Uh, any thoughts on Catherine Hughes' opposition to suffrage? Yeah, that uh, the, the, this is a tricky one where I, I I keep having to sort of speculate, and that's an, something I've had to do a lot in the context of Hughes because getting back to what I said about lack of uh, of personal documentation. The only sense I can make about it is that she's very much drawing uh, on uh, the Catholic custom of uh, or the situation where Catholic activists putting their energy into church related societies. And when you look at so in other words, she's involved in, in society, the Catholic Indian Associ uh, Association, then involved in the Catholic Women's League in, uh, in Edmonton. When you look at a lot of the women figures, not a not 100 ex percent uh, uh, exclusive, but most of the activists who supported uh, suffrage were Protestants. Anglo-Saxon Protestants and Catherine Hughes could find uh, lots of sort of commonalities between herself and say, for example, other female journalists and how the challenges they had to play. But whatever she was, she was not an Anglo-Saxon Protestant. So I think that was a point of sort of separation uh, between herself and, and people such as Emily Murphy, who she would have known in, in Edmonton. Thank you. From uh, Ronald Gillis, uh, was the biography of Van Horn ever corrected in subsequent reprintings? No. And the basis for my comment about, about uh, Vaughan as being the editor has been the work I did. The Catherine Hughes papers are in the uh, Library and Archives Canada. And in some ways, in first glance, it's kind of a really disappointing collection because there's only a limited amount of Irish material and uh, Part of that was because uh, um, in the 1950s, De Valera was in contact, or one of Hughes's sisters was in contact with De Valera, and De Valera arranged that the Irish uh, uh, embassy in Ottawa would ship uh, Hughes's Irish material back to Ireland. That explains why it's in UCD archives now. But in the context of the, uh, the, the papers in Ottawa, 
There is, however, a, a typescript by Hughes of the Van Horn biography. And what I have done at several occasions, I've sat down with the, with the published work and the typescript, and you could see where essentially what Vaughn was doing was editing. He was leaving out sections. Uh, he was linking up paragraphs once he once he excised material. And again, I would that, that's the basis of my statement. He's the editor, not the author. But no, that's never been uh, uh, n n n never been corrected. Interesting enough, perhaps about 20, 25 years ago, in one of his works, uh, uh, something like Pierre, Pierre Burton kind of made the point. He described Catherine Hughes as Van Horn's biographer, but it's never been it's never been uh, uh, acknowledged publicly. Pierre Burton was on the ball so many times. Very interesting. <laughs> uh, from Dara, from Dara Gannon. Um, an excellent presentation based on your important book on Catherine Hughes. Can you reflect on Hughes's reaction to the Irish Race Congress in Paris? Evidently, it was not the significant global Irish move moment uh, that she'd been working towards post-treaty. Yeah, that uh, two things about the about the uh, the Irish Race Congress in Paris. One is that the way that all Hughes's work on it was essentially kind of uh, uh, minimized, where somebody, for example, like uh, Thomas Hughes, can remember his last name, one of the one of the uh, officials from the United States, was credited as the organizer. Hughes was the one who actually did the leg work and setting that up. But when it actually came to the event being uh, 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 taken place, her role was, 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 was minimized. As regards um, its goal versus the reality, yes, it was a debacle. Yeah, there were aspects of it that worked out fairly well, like the cultural parts of it because it was meant as a showcase also for Ireland's culture and, and, uh, and uh, manufacturing industries. But in the context of how Hughes saw it as a, as, as a way of linking together all these Irish communities and uh, Irish descendants uh, worldwide, it was a complete disaster. Very few people turned up. Uh, that uh, from Canada or from Newfoundland, uh, I think that, that Billy, if I remember his last name, uh, turned up, very few turned up from Canada. Most decided not to travel. People were arriving sort of from Bolivia and other parts of South America. There were issues about accreditation at the time, but it was, uh, it was overtaken by events in Ireland. And when uh, when various Irish representatives turned up from Ireland, they attempted to um, stay away from the contentious issue of the treaty and what was what was happening back in Ireland. But in reality, uh, it it becomes an occasion where these issues get uh, get uh, aired. And Hughes clearly is anti-treaty. And there are those on the on the pro treaty side who are very very reluctant to support uh, a global Irish organisation in case it gets hijacked by the anti treaty movement. So again, they tried to avoid contemporary situation in Ireland. There was no running away from it, and it, and it undermines the whole thing. Thank you, um, Sean Conway. You're leaving us hanging. A question for the speaker but then just a colon. So uh, feel free to, to uh, type more. Uh, meanwhile, Michael Vance, um, is it fair to say that Hughes was a double outlier as an anti-treaty nationalist and a woman? Thinking of Dara's paper, there appear to be particular challenges for recovering female views in writing the intellectual history of the period. Absolutely, no doubt about that. Uh, if, certainly, Hughes ran into uh, uh, into uh, this issue of a woman in a male-dominated organization in, uh, in the United States, or male-dominated movement in the United States. Uh, 
and uh, the associate personal experience. But having said that, and it's clear from comments made by somebody like Harry Boland, was that she didn't suffer fools kind of uh, lightly. So she could be quite hard on the, she had standards as regards competency. But it's interesting, and perhaps this brings us back to the question of her view on, on suffrage. She met people like Hannah Sheehy Skeffington uh, in the United States. And uh, Hannah Sheehy had, uh, Scavington was with Francis, heavily involved in the movement for suffrage in the period before, before 1916. But when you look at Hannah Sheehy Scavington herself, in a way, she parks that with the expectation or the hope that uh, uh, that the a new Ireland that would be that would emerge would be one that would recognize women's rights only to find that the, uh, the free state for example is a pretty cold spot for 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 women so it strikes me that it's almost though Hughes never publicly revisits the issue she is rubbing shoulders with people like Hannah she has skipped and one presumes that her her attitude about suffrage whatever evolves over a period of, over a period of time but uh, trying then to work or to place the role of activists such as Hughes uh, in the uh, in in the uh, Irish independence movement remains a challenge. You could see it happen in the 1920s already. For example, there was a little book I remember. It's a Fitzgerald's book about uh, the Irish Free State in the 1920s, and uh, there is stuff about the publicity campaign in the United States during the War of Independence, during the Irish Revolution, as such. And somebody like Hughes has written out of it. And some of it is treaty, anti-treaty, but clearly as well, some of it as, as a woman activist, she's written out of it. Well, thank you very much, Porik, for writing her back in. Uh, um, thank it's, you. Uh, uh, David. Yes, indeed. Sean, Sean Conway, just a quick, uh, I would like to, I, I, of course, it's technology, so I will always get it wrong. I had I had intended to ask the uh, the author for just a quick comment about this remarkable woman, uh, whom you've described so and analyzed so very well today, as well as in your marvelous book. How we did not know more about her until you arrived on the scene. It seems to me an astonishing commentary, and not necessarily a polite one on, uh, um, shall I say, the history this community of Canadian historians, but that's, that's another matter. I'm quite intrigued. She seems to have been a networker extraordinaire. I mean, here she is a young woman from a small part of a small part of Canada. Uh, and other than her uncle, the um, Archbishop of, of Halifax, which I would not diminish. So that's an extremely important launch pad for the community that she initially is most connected to and concerned about. But very quickly, whether it's the Ottawa Press Gallery, uh, linking up with the Van Horns. Um, I'm particularly interested in her connections to the, uh, the new and developing government of Alberta, um, where it's clear to me that she enjoys very quickly the patronage of one of the most powerful people in Canada in the first two decades of the 20th century, Arthur Lewis Sifton. What do we know about about that relationship, because clearly Sifton, who of course is the older brother of, um, of Clifford Sifton uh, and their half brother, literally John Wesley Dayfall, the powerful, uh, probably most powerful English Canadian editor in the first half of the 20th century. Um, it, she, she, she lands in his office as a private secretary and shortly thereafter gets what would be considered in political circles, a pretty damn plum job in London um, and then it starts to go from the point of view of the sponsor, I can imagine, awry. Because uh, if memory serves me correctly, Sifton, who is Premier of Alberta for seven years, then joins the Unionist government in Canada. And before he dies, I think he's, as a minister, responsible for the Secret Service, where the reports about his former private secretary are arriving. And I'm sure to his utter dismay and stupefaction, um, so I'm just really intrigued by that relationship uh, between, and I don't mean to suggest something that would be the stuff of, uh, you know, 21st century social media, 
but I'm just talking about, um, you know, the professional and political material. Um, there's some, there's, there seems to me more here than, than we yet know about. Yeah, it may, it may well be. Uh, I describe Hughes as a social worker and a social climber. So she is very good at, at these networks, absolutely no doubt about that. But it's interesting, you mentioned the point that when uh, Sifton was in the federal government, yes, he was receiving reports, RC, RC, RCMP reports that included material in Hughes, but he died in the early 1920s, maybe 22, 23 or whatever, around that time. But there is a letter from uh, Hughes' sister, Loretta, after his, uh, after uh, uh, Sifton's death to his widow, sort of, and it's really friendly terms about talking about the way in which he had always been very nice to the family. And uh, so it's kind of interesting that uh, uh, Loretta Hughes is an interesting character in her own right about whom some work has been done, but her involvement, not just in the Catholic Women's League, but also with, uh, with uh, as, uh, in, uh, as a labor activist, in the Alberta of the time, so making connections again with 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 government. Uh, what else is there to be said, or what else is there to be uncovered? I don't know. I don't know. I I, I, I hope somebody comes up with that cache of letters uh, and uh, somewhere there or diaries. And I, I final point I would make: the Siftons uh, certainly uh, were not um, were not uh, without views and rather strong views on the Irish question. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, Sean, we need to take a break now, but thanks very much for your question. Um, coming up is someone I think probably most people here won't have heard of: uh, Osmond Esmond. Well, stay tuned because this is a remarkable story of another Sinn Féin envoy whose career touched on the dominions of Australia, New Zealand and Canada, places where revolutionary Irish messages were a tough sell. So uh, we're coming in in eight minutes, 11.30 with uh, Shane Lynn. Uh, thank you very much for your questions. Um, thank you very much, uh, Podrick, for uh, bringing bringing back to uh, historical light and life uh, the forgotten, previously forgotten figure of Catherine Hughes. You've done a great service to uh, Canadian historiography. Um, we will leave it there. We'll resume uh, at 11.30. Thanks so much and see you then. Bye-bye. Is it frozen?
I'm sorry, Anna Maria, you have a question? No, sorry. Okay, no problem.
Welcome back, everyone. Um, Shane, you're good to go? Yeah, all good to go. Okay, great. All right, welcome back. Um, this is the last time that I will introduce Shane Lynn as a graduate student at the University of Toronto, as he's only a few days away from completing his doctoral dissertation on global Irish nationalism and the South African War. Shane already has an extraordinary track record. As an undergraduate at Trinity College Dublin, he won the gold medal in history and his major undergraduate research paper on O'Connellite societies in Canada formed the basis of an article in Irish Historical Studies, the preeminent historical journal in Ireland. An essay he wrote in my Irish Nationalism in Canada course on Irish Canadian revolutionary activities during the famine was subsequently published in Era Ireland, the preeminent Irish studies journal in the United States. And his master's research paper won the Irish Association of Australia and New Zealand Postgraduate Essay Prize and was published in the Australasian Journal of Irish Studies, the preeminent Irish studies journal in Australasia. Osmond Esmond is the subject of his talk, as I mentioned a few minutes ago. Uh, Osmond Esmond is almost completely unknown in Canada. That is about to change. Shane, over to you. Thanks very much, David, um, for your very kind introduction. So, um, <clears throat> and thank you everyone for, um, for sticking with us today on a, on a long haul on Zoom. We've just heard from Padraig all about Catherine Hughes's remarkable accomplishments. But what happens when you're tasked with a pretty similar job, but you are someone who is temperamentally incapable of being discreet? Enter Osmond Esmond. He was supposed to do something quite similar to Catherine Hughes, follow the same route, traveling through Canada, Australia, and New Zealand to help get the self-determination leagues off the ground. But whereas for Catherine Hughes, things went relatively smoothly, for Osmond Esmond, everything that could go wrong did go wrong. He ended up being imprisoned one way or another for a total of five months. He was deported five times and he was tried twice in court for sedition. But Esmond's story is more than just um, a comedy of errors or a crap 1920s odyssey. What I think is really fascinating about it is the way that he became this medium through which the colonial governments of Britain's white settler colonies expressed their hostility to Sinn Féin. Part of this reason was, was because he, his trip came at a very sensitive time. The Great War had tightened the threads of empire. Loyalist feeling was running high. Um, membership of the Orange Order in Canada, for example, was peaking. There was a post-war economic depression that had prov provoked industrial unrest across the empire, notably the massive Winnipeg general strike of 1919. People looking at the world around them saw Russia falling to communism and Ireland in rebellion. There was this deep feeling of unease among the governing classes in the empire about the dangers posed by disloyalists, be they Bolsheviks or Catholics or Fenians or any other flavor of bogeyman, whether they were real or imagined. Uh, these elites responded in various ways. They banned processions and certain flags. They censored print and images that were deemed seditious and they ramped up surveillance on agitators. In the middle of all this, they saw Osmond Esmond as another rabble rouser, this nuisance who wanted to take their good Irish of the dominions to appeal to their worst instincts and incite them to behave like the bad Irish of the United States and of Sinn Féin in Ireland. So they came down on him very hard he became this sort of Fenian piñata that various loyal officials and journalists took turns to thwack at. The passion of Osmond Esmond, 
if we can call it that, sent a clear message to the Irish nationalists of the Dominions. And that message was something like, look, we'd really rather you didn't mix with this lot. Okay, so Ireland's diaspora for generations, as many of you already know, had been a vital source of funding and propaganda for Irish nationalist organizations at home. And for much of the War of Independence, Eamon de Valera and his Irish diplomatic mission in the United States were busy scooping up this financial and moral support. But de Valera's falling out with John Devoy and other leading Irish Americans who control the Friends of Irish Freedom told him that local elites couldn't always be relied on. And he'd need direct control over the apparatus of pro Sinn Féin agitation outside of Ireland. So it was for this reason that he launched his rival organization in the United States, the characteristically formulaic title, the American Association for the Recognition of the Irish Republic. And as we've heard already from Podrick, the Self-Determination for Ireland League was to be the sort of sanitized dominion offshoot of this initiative. And uh, Catherine Hughes, as we know now, uh, successfully established this organization in Canada and Newfoundland. The next logical step was to roll it out in Australia and New Zealand. But Hughes wasn't especially well known in that part of the world. So it was decided to send her some help. The Irish diplomatic mission in DC, they wanted someone who could complement Hughes's organizational skills with someone who could give a lecture tour on the struggle in Ireland. And they wanted someone who could speak with some authority on the Sinn Féin movement, but someone who also had a clean record and a good name and who wouldn't be too objectionable to Australasian sensibilities. Osmond Esmond had been hired already at the Irish diplomatic mission in Washington, DC earlier in 1920. He'd seen before this two brief stints of service during the Great War, but he was radicalized after the 1916 rising and he joined Sinn Féin in 1918. He came from pretty impressive Irish nationalist pedigree. His father was the baronet Sir Thomas Grattan Esmond, who was a senior member of the Irish Parliamentary Party. And during the 1918 election, Osmond campaigned for Sinn Féin and actually contributed to his own father's defeat at the polls in his North Wexford constituency. The Esmond name was also well known down under. Osmond's father had been a member of a successful Irish party fundraising delegation that had visited Australia and New Zealand back in 1889. And Osmond himself was well-spoken, he was witty, he had a sardonic sense of humor and a pretty good knowledge of Irish politics. To De Valera, it seemed like he would be the best man for the job of following Catherine Hughes down to Australia at least from the limited options that were available to him. But the problem was, Osmond Desmond was also a bit eccentric. His name wasn't the only thing about him that stood out. Reporters liked to dwell on his striking appearance, and they referred to him as things like the dandified Sinn Féiner. He was tall, he was handsome, he had this languid manner. He liked to wear a pencil mustache and a monocle and a bow tie. At 24 years old, he wasn't terribly experienced and his reliability was also a little bit questionable. He had twice dropped out of undergraduate programs at Oxford and UCD. And as we'll see, he was pretty prone to dramatic flourishes. It was this mischievous sense of humor and his love of having an audience that first landed him in trouble. His trip from Washington DC to Vancouver had passed off without incident. And on the 17th of December, 1920, he boarded the SS Makura, which was bound for Sydney 
across the Pacific. After Christmas, as the vessel was making its way between Fiji and Auckland, Esmond decided it would be a good idea to sit at the piano in the saloon and to regale his fellow passengers with this bawdy and satirical and offensive song that he'd written about Viscount French, who was at the time Lord Lieutenant of Ireland. Naturally, many of the other passengers weren't impressed with this. And the word spread through the vessel that there was a Sinn Féin envoy on board. When the Makura arrived at Auckland, the authorities were warned of this and Esmond was prohibited from landing. And during the days that followed, as the ship then crossed the Tasman Sea from Auckland to its final destination, Sydney, Esmond became this sort of imperial emergency. There was this flurry of telegrams exchanged between the prime ministers of New Zealand, the prime minister of Australia, between Dublin Castle, and Winston Churchill, who was then colonial secretary. And the subject of all of this was, what are we going to do about this guy? Billy Hughes, the prime minister of Australia, had an idea. The day before Esmond was due to arrive at Sydney, Hughes rushed through emergency legislation in the Australian parliament that empowered customs officials to require any British subject landing at an Australian port to swear an oath of allegiance as a condition of entry. Now, as we know, uh, oaths of allegiance were like kryptonite to Irish Republicans before 1927, obviously, when, of course, they became empty formulas. But in early 1921, it would have been absolutely unacceptable for Osmond Esmond, this supposed accredited envoy of the supposed Irish Republic, to swear an oath that effectively renounced it. So, of course, he refused. And that looked like it was going to be the end of it. Esmond would immediately take the trip, the return trip to Vancouver on the Makura. But it wasn't going to be that simple. Within a few days of his arrival in Sydney, the crew of the Makura joined in a general shipping strike that was happening at Sydney Harbour. Esmond couldn't leave, but he wasn't allowed to land either. The Makura was towed out to anchor in Rose Bay on the southeastern edge of Sydney Harbour, and Esmond was still in it, a prisoner, effectively. So he had failed in his mission spectacularly. But at the same time, the Australian government's plan to deprive Esmond of a platform in their country had also kind of backfired. Esmond case, Esmond's case was so peculiar that it ended up attracting an awful lot of press attention. People were fascinated by this spectacle of a foppish young aristocrat who was marooned in the harbour with an entire ocean liner all to himself. And they would sail up to the Makura on various boats and pleasure craft, seeking an audience with Esmond, who would lounge over the ship's railings and gladly accept gifts of fruit and cigarettes. Reporters remarked on his boyish exuberance, on his fashionable appearance and his dry wit. When they asked him about his voyage across the Pacific, for example, he recounted that, yes, New Zealand had turned him away, but Hawaii and Fiji had allowed him to land because, quote, they are more civilized countries. It was still unclear at this point what would become of Esmond if or when the shipping strike ever ended. Would he even be allowed to land at Vancouver when the Makura eventually returned there, or would he be be treated the same way. He joked to reporters that he supposed he was to become, quote, a citizen of the high seas and that the shipping company will just have to keep on feeding me until I die. Now, 
Amidst all of these half-mocking and half-admiring accounts of Esmond's strange predicament and his intriguing personality, there was a general consensus in the Australian press that was actually in support of the government's action in barring him. Yes, he, he received some muted support from certain quarters, but for the most part, Australia's Irish nationalists weren't willing to stick their necks out just for his sake. Catherine Hughes, who was then quietly establishing branches of the Self-Determination League in Australia and New Zealand, saw no use in tying their fate to Esmond's. And Irish Australians generally were far more concerned that the famous Irish Republican Archbishop of Melbourne, Daniel Mannix, who had recently been denied entry to England in a similar fashion, might be treated the same way on his return home to Australia. Anyway, by March 1900, the shipping strike finally ended. Esmond had been stranded in Sydney Harbour for a total of seven weeks. Not anymore. The Makura headed east back across the Pacific with Esmond on board. And it, it docked again at Auckland um, and was put up at dry dock for a few days. But Esmond was again prohibited from landing there. Um, he claimed later, though, that he'd been able to meet some of the area's leading Irish nationalists all the same, whether by sneaking himself out or by sneaking them in, presumably like, like a teenager. Over in Vancouver, um, the press had been following Esmond's exploits by now for several months. And by the time he returned to the city on the 30th of March, 1900, everybody knew he was coming. At the docks, he was greeted by a hostile loyalist demonstration. Now, the good news was Canada wasn't gonna require Esmond to swear an oath of allegiance to enter the country but they were gonna drag him before an immigration inquiry to adjudicate his case. Um, and while these immigration authorities debated whether to let him in, Esmond presented this persona of an innocent bumbling aristocrat who was just wandering around and presumably hoped that that would make him appear less threatening. And it might have worked because he was eventually admitted as a quote, ordinary tourist. But well, the thing is, obviously, he wasn't an ordinary tourist, and nobody knew this better than the local self-determination for Ireland League, who the next day invited him to come speak at one of their meetings. Esmond, presuming that he was among friends, told everyone in attendance a few jokes. He spoke a little about events in Ireland, and he reprised his little ditty about the Lord Lieutenant. But a reporter had managed to slip into the audience and to take notes. The next day, a pretty sensationalized account of the meeting was splashed across the front page of the Vancouver Sun. According to this report, Esmond had broken a promise that he supposedly made of good behavior to the immigration authorities, and he'd given a speech, quote, of lurid hues, red and green, Bolshevistic and Sinn Féin, unquote. Over the following days, the Loyalist press ratcheted up the pressure on the local authorities to do something about Osmond Esmond. One editorial declared, quote, men of Esmond's stamp have no mission in Canada. Strife breeders are not desirable as citizens or as visitors, unquote. And they got what they wanted. Within a few days, Esmond was arrested on a charge of making seditious utterances. He spent the night of his 25th birthday in a Vancouver jail cell. Now, the mayor of Vancouver had hoped throughout all of this that the federal government would, government would step in and take up the case against Esmond. But when he learned it was going to be up to his city to prosecute, he offered to release Esmond if he would promise to leave Canada immediately. And if Esmond had any sense, he would have accepted this offer. But it seems that he sniffed out weakness here and, and a chance to embarrass the people who were persecuting him. He refused. And so the case 
went to trial. Now, in the meantime, events in Ireland were causing tensions in Vancouver to boil over. In August 1920, earlier, uh, Catherine Hughes had told de Valera of how difficult things could be there for Irish nationalists. Quote, the entire Vancouver press, she wrote, was in a shameful condition. And the local self-determination league branch was, quote, almost submerged under English dictation and intolerance. While Osmond Esmond was awaiting trial, Robert Lindsay Crawford came to lecture in the city as part of the countrywide tour. Um, and while about 750 people sat in the Dominion Hall in the city to listen to him speak, a crowd of thousands of loyalist protesters gathered outside and drowned Crawford out with a military band that played raucous patriotic tunes and sang, God Save the Queen. When the meeting ended and the attendees tried to file out on the street, a, a scene similar to what Audrey has already mentioned, um, or sorry, I think Dara already mentioned in, uh, in New Brunswick played out. The protesters for, formed this narrow passage arched with Union Jacks. Um, and local press reports actually praised the conduct of the protesters. Here's how they described the scene. Those who refused to salute the flag were stripped of their headgear and in many cases made to kiss the emblem. Those who showed fight were hustled through the crowd and given souvenirs in the shape of black eyes and sore heads. You Huns, traitor, you Sinn Féin swine, get back to Ireland, Canada first. These were the savage verbal onslaughts that greeted those who passed. As they reached the flags, they were surrounded and a strong arm would shoot out and stuff the corner of the flag into their faces, at times into the mouth of the per scared perspiring Sinn Féiners. Unquote. So clearly, Sinn Féin sympathizers were not very popular in Vancouver. And to Osmond Esmond, it was unclear how bad things might get while he was in the city. When a young man who bore a striking resemblance to him was shot dead on the street, Esmond was convinced that this was a case of mistaken identity and that the bullet had been intended for him. But whatever the case, Esmond had to prepare for his trial. De Valera's men in America sent him money to cover his legal expenses. And the man who came to deliver it was not very optimistic about Esmond's chances before a jury in Vancouver. He reported, quote, British Columbia and Vancouver are exceedingly pro-British and anti-Irish in their sentiment. They make a fetish of loyalty to the British Empire. They're extremely unreasonable and harsh in this attitude. Even the priests, are afraid to openly espouse the cause for Ireland." Unquote. Esmond's trial commenced on the 22nd of May, 1900. Of the two Crown witnesses, both were Vancouver Sun reporters, and they repeated the accusations they had made in the paper. The witnesses for Esmond's defence were all Self-Determination League members. They insisted that Esmond had given this very mild and jocular speech and that it was, quote, of a humorous rather than a serious nature. The prosecution obviously saw that establishing the precise content of Esmond's speech was going to be a matter of their word against his. So instead, the League Council decided to shift the attention onto the Self-Determination League. He drew their witnesses into admissions that they supported Ireland's separation from the Empire, and he basically placed Sinn Féin on trial. It's a fair criticism, he told the jury, to judge a man by the company that he keeps. But the trial ended in a hung jury. A retrial was scheduled to be held in a week. But there was a problem. Esmond's lawyer was leaving on a trip to England within a few days, and Esmond didn't have the money or the time to find a replacement. So on the 27th of May, two days before the second trial, Esmond announced that he was going to represent himself. Now reporters present in the courtroom on the day of this, the, this retrial remarked that it contained an unusually large number of women. And they weren't disappointed. The prosecution presented basically the same arguments as before, but all eyes were on Esmond. And he cast off this 
air that he had adopted of innocence. And he delivered what the papers describe as a masterly performance. He made the, the, the audience roar with laughter as he cross-examined his accusers with his jokes. Summing up, he told the jury, don't be misled by a five cent paper. Look at me and judge for yourselves whether I'm the kind of man to come here with blood in my eye, hatred in my heart and a bomb in my pocket. Even the judge leaned in favor of Esmond in his closing statement. But Esmond's flourish of brilliance turned out to be a bad idea. It allowed the prosecution to paint him now as the, quote, scarlet pimpernel of Fenianism, someone who, quote, under the guise of being a silly ass, turns out to be a splendid plotter. The Orange Sentinel, um, Canada's leading loyalist newspaper, remarked that now, quote, he stood revealed in his true character as an able and dangerous opponent. And in the eyes of the jury, too, Esmond's cunning only proved his guilt. After only an hour's deliberation, they recommended that he be deported from the country immediately. But the judge disagreed. He said, the wrong man is in the box. And he stared pointedly at the self-determination leaders. He decided to release Esmond on his own recognizance to leave the country within a reasonable time frame. After two months in Vancouver, most of it locked up, Esmond boarded an eastbound train. He was asked for comment by a reporter at the station. He smirked and he said, I had heard that Vancouver suffered from too much rain, but I depart absolutely convinced that it suffers from too much sun, meaning of course the newspaper. Esmond was shadowed on his journey eastward by the RCMP. Um, we've already heard a little bit about their activities. Um, he stopped briefly at Ottawa. He, he gave a short audience in the train station, but then he arrived in Montreal. And the contrast between his treatment there compared with elsewhere in the empire is quite striking. Whereas in Vancouver, the mayor had sent him to jail. In Montreal, the mayor a French Canadian, Médéric Martin, stood beside him on stage at a packed meeting of Irish sympathizers that was held in Esmond's honor in the city at the Monument National Theatre. For generations, Quebec had been the safest part of the empire in which to hold advanced nationalist views. And this wasn't because Irish Canadians and French Canadians got along particularly well. Generally, they, they didn't. Instead, it was because the French majority acted as a sort of indifferent buffer between the Irish Catholic minority in Montreal and Quebec and the loyal Anglo-Protestant majority in the rest of Canada. And after the imposition of conscription in 1917 in Canada, a lot of French Canadian nationalists were pretty annoyed with Anglo imperialism, and they started to openly sympathize with the unfolding struggle in Ireland. Osmond Esmond opened his speech in Montreal in French, and he thanked the French Canadians present for attending, despite the fact that he was a recently convicted criminal, he joked. He claimed that the press in the British dominions was, quote, 100% more hostile to Ireland than the press in England. Speeches that were routinely made on the Irish question in the House of Lords, he said, would result in arrest if they were given in Vancouver. And he said it was a pity that many Irish Canadians allowed themselves to be cowed by this atmosphere of intolerance. Sinn Féin, he said, was not at war with the British peoples throughout the world. It was at war with, quote, the savages who are butchering our people and ruining our homes. No arrest followed this speech. Esmond returned to Ireland by the end of July. Later in his career, he, he supported the Anglo-Irish Treaty. And in 1923, he was elected as a common Gael TD, a development which was reported with some incredulity in the Vancouver newspapers. 
Shortly afterwards, he inherited his father's baronetcy, becoming Sir Osmond Esmond. In 1926, he was selected as one of the Irish Free States for delegates to the Empire Parliamentary Association Conference in Australia. So he traveled to Vancouver, he boarded a steamship there, and he headed for Sydney. The Australian government, noticing that this was happening, sent a flurry of telegrams again to London, asking what they should do about Osmond Desmond. The conclusion they came to was, ah, he's a TD, he's already taken the oath of allegiance, let him in. That's it, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Shane. One second here. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and um, it is indeed um, a, a fascinating and in many respects revealing story. Um, and again, I invite questions on the chat line. Um, and so I look forward to those. Um, one of the points uh, that, that came out uh, to me very strikingly that I'd just like you to um, elaborate, um, if possible, is the difference between Montreal and Vancouver. Um, it seems that we, we're not only going from one side of the country to, well, sort of central Canada at any rate, but um, we're going from, from a, an ultra loyalist environment to an environment that is much more congenial for uh, not simply Irish nationalists, but radical Irish nationalists. Uh, could you elaborate on that and, the, and, and perhaps talk more generally about, um, about the, the historical context of Montreal uh, when it comes to Irish nationalism in Canada? Uh, sure, yeah, I'll, I'll give that a go. Um, the, um, I mean, it goes, it goes way back to the 1820s, obviously, there had been pretty positive relations between uh, a more radical sort of O'Connellite Irish nationalist and um, the, uh, the, the French Canadian Patriot movement, um, which culminated in a rebellion, as we know. Um, and there were some Irish sympathizers behind that, but um, relations sort of soured afterward, despite attempts to, to reconstruct them in the middle of the century uh, between Irish radicals and French Canadian nationalists. And they fell out over things like church governance. French Canadians weren't happy with all the waves of um, poor and cholera-ridden Irish immigrants that poured in through Quebec and Montreal. Um, and uh, ne nevertheless, um, Irish uh, advanced national advanced Irish national was was allowed to sort of flourish in this bubble that Montreal and Quebec afforded. I think that's because um, uh, really the, the Anglo loyalists, when they thought about Quebec, they were thinking about French Canadians and they were worrying about French Canadian loyalty and no one was paying an awful lot of attention to the small, relatively small Irish nationalist community in Montreal and Quebec. And because these communities were somewhat distant from um, Irish communities elsewhere in Canada, they were also prone to more influence from south of the border, um, especially from uh, Fenian type Irish nationalists in the Eastern United States. And we do see that happening at various points throughout history, notably during the South African war. Um, but things kicked off a bit uh, between, um, in a positive way between uh, French Canadians and Irish Canadian nationalists after the great war. Um, Henri Bourassa obviously was, was a notable French Canadian anti-imperialist who liked to identify um, some parallels and um, sympathies between Irish and French Canadian nationalists. Um, so I, th I think this really enabled Esmond to enjoy himself a little bit in Montreal and not be harassed and to speak his mind and to give the speeches that he was dispatched to give in the first place. I think the... Um, uh... The parallel with Lindsay Crawford is very interesting because um, uh, you've seen the uh, secret police reports. In fact, it's thanks to you that I know about the secret police reports. Um, and uh, they indicate that Lindsay Crawford um, 
in, with the statesmen and the Protestant friends of Ireland had very little influence in Toronto and much more influence in Montreal. Uh, uh, it, there's a parallel here, I think, with, uh, with the situation uh, facing Osmond Esmond in Vancouver and Montreal. And uh, when I go back to the, uh, open up the chat questions in a moment, when I go back to my own work on the Fenians in Canada, Toronto sets the pace briefly from about 1858 uh, through to, the, to about 1865, 66. After that, Montreal just takes over um, and uh, the Hibernian Benevolent Society, the Fenian Front Organization in Toronto uh, dwindles in significance very rapidly after 1866. But in Montreal, pro-invasion Fenianism uh, continues to, to flourish. Uh, anyhow, uh, I will now open this up to, uh, to general questions um, and comments uh, from Anne Tate. Entertaining story I knew nothing about and illuminating about Canada and the difference between Vancouver and Montreal. Thank you, Anne. Uh, uh, Ronald Gillis, uh, the oath of allegiance he refused to sign. Was that for the entire British Empire? Or was it specific to Australia when the legislation was rushed through upon his arrival? Good question. That was specific to Australia. And yeah, yeah, good question. Um, that, that was the specific mechanism that the Australians decided to use to frustrate Esmond. Um, and he was the catalyst for this, um, which is pretty, pretty extraordinary. Uh, but presumably it came with added benefits for keeping other sorts of uh, potential disloyalists out. Um, uh, other, other mechanisms were used in other parts of the British Empire. Um, in New Zealand, I think you know, there was just some sort of um, executive order by the immigration authorities who already had this power to um, select and refuse uh, immigrants that they didn't want um, in the country. Um, and in Canada, obviously, there was this immigration um, inquiry. It was, it was decentralized a little bit. But the oath, um, <laughs> the oath was specifically Australia. Okay, th thank you. Uh, from Porig, uh, great stuff, Shane. Uh, this may be tangential to your focus, but the story of Agent Thomas Bell, the former RIC man turned RCMP officer who claimed to have infiltrated the Vancouver Self-Determination for Ireland League coincides with the presence of Osmond Esmond in BC. Was there a connection? Um, I, I don't think it was a coincidence um, that this particular agent was assigned to uh, Irish nationalists, Irish Republican associations in Vancouver, right around the time that Esmond was expected. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, it's, it's an interesting story that you raise, um, Padraig. I'll, I suppose I'll tell people here who, who wouldn't be familiar with it. Um, this guy, he was um, from... Uh, County uh, Antrim. He was a former RIC man, as you say, um, assigned by the RCMP to watch Irish nationalist organizations in Vancouver around uh, this time. Uh, but he was rumbled. Um, his identity was exposed by uh, a local socialist newspaper in Vancouver, uh, I think the BC Federationist. Um, and as a result, he was uh, roughed up pretty badly uh, by his former Marx. Um, he was spirited away to an RCMP hospital in Regina, Saskatchewan, but uh, to recuperate from his wounds. But he uh, stepped in front of a moving freight train, walked out of the hospital and, and took his own life. And it was speculated in um, Joseph McGarrity's newspaper in Philadelphia um, that uh, this was because he had been unmasked and he couldn't live with the shame of having been a spy and informant. But we don't know. It's, it's quite a sad story. But that coincided with Esmond's, Esmond's journey. Um, what we have no proof uh, to say that he had any specific order to watch Esmond. We'll have to assume that he did. Thank you. Um, from Pa Sheehan, and Shane, I think this question is particularly relevant uh, to your current situation. Uh, I wonder, has there been any research on long-term Irish permanent residents of Canada who refuse to apply uh, for citizenship due to the requirements to take the oath of citizenship? Anecdotally, I've met quite a few. Off topic, but just curious. <laughs> that's, a, that's a great question, and yeah, something that 
something I'm faced with myself if I'm lucky enough to get to the ceremony over the next few months um, to take my own citizenship. Uh, I don't know if there has been any research. I don't think there has been. Um, I'd be really interested to hear stories about that. Um, of course, if anyone anyone present knows anything about that, um, feel free to stick it in the chat. It would be very interesting. But uh, it's it does rankle with me a little bit, um, given that most Canadians, I think, who are born here aren't aware that this is a requirement for new immigrants and never have to swear such an oath themselves. Um, particularly tricky for Irish folks. So maybe we should all have to swear it then. Okay. <laughs> or no. See, see how long it lasts then. <laughs> right. uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Pa. I think uh, you have a good article there. Uh, uh, you can start the research tomorrow. Mm. Uh, from Gail, uh, did Esmond support Mussolini? Call him the Abraham Lincoln of Africa? Uh, I know not directly related to the 1920-21 period in Canadian history, so please skip if you believe it's not related. I, no, I, he did. I, th I think it's a very important part of his later career. Um, like an awful lot of um, treatyite um, Sinn Féiners, uh, Common Aguil TDs, uh, Esmond was pretty sympathetic with um, fascism and Catholic fascism and vocationalism and th this sort of thing. He did he did say that about uh, Mussolini, incredibly, the Abraham Lincoln of Africa. Um, and uh, he, he was prone to other sorts of dramatic flourishes. He uh, laid uh, a wreath of vegetables um, on the statue of Queen Victoria outside of Leinster House. That was a particular crusade of his to have that thing removed, as it later was. Um, he, he was also known to do other sort of bizarre stuff. Um, he, oh, on the fascism question, he was a member of the Army Comrades Association. So he, he was a blue shirt um, in, in the 1930s, uh, which makes sense, right? He's a wealthy um, Catholic aristocrat, treaty out Irish nationalist. I think a lot of them were. Um, he was known to um, fly around in his private airplane, uh, throwing out election literature around the Irish countryside as well. Um, a, a really colourful later career that needs more research, I think. There's, there's a decent uh, dictionary of biography entry on him by Owen McGee, but um, I think someone could do more. Thank you. Uh, the Abraham Lincoln of Africa for Mussolini. My goodness. Uh, Sean O'Shea, uh, was there any involvement of longshoremen unions in Irish Republican groups in Canadian cities as was seen in US cities? That's a really good question, Sean. And I, I think that there must have been, certainly from, from the um, government papers uh, that I looked at uh, in this research and in, in newspaper reports of the time, um, red and green were very commonly conflated. There, there was believed to be a general Sinn Féin Bolshevik conspiracy um, and uh, processions were clamped down on in much the same way in various cities uh, in Canada and in Australia and New Zealand, whether they were um, labor movement processions um, or Irish nationalist processions. Um, certain emblems were banned and people were forced to carry the Union Jack at the head of the procession in certain cities. Um, Vancouver was one of them. Um, but as for... Um, the actual connections between Labour, um, oh, also uh, the, the RCMP were, were, were sure that um, uh, the IWW um, were, were deeply involved with Sinn Féin uh, sympathising. And they did often uh, sympathise with, with Sinn Féin, but I don't know how many, how extensive were the connections between, for example, the self-determination leagues and um, Labour organisations, but, but I would imagine there must have been some, even if they were only informal. Thank you. There's a comment from uh, Hilary McKenzie to everyone. Nobody. I think that probably refers to the oath of allegiance uh, <laughs> uh, comments we made earlier. Nobody should take an oath of allegiance. <laughs> Correct in that, Hilary. Just give me a, a yes. Uh, Michael Vance, um, fascinating tale. Uh, the photo of Dev in headdress raises the contemporary question raised by the Comintern and the Communist League against imperialism 
on the relationship between revolutionary movements and indigenous peoples. It's not the focus of your paper, but other than Dev's speech to the Lake Superior Chippewa, is there any evidence that Sinn Féin engaged with such a question in their effort to gain international support? I think that's a really important question. And it's something that I imagine more research is being done on recently. Um, I would say maybe Dara Gannon will be more aware of, of what's been found on this question. Um, certainly I didn't come across it, uh, but I do know that there were um, affinities between uh, at this time, um, revolutionary Irish nationalists and Indian nationalists, for example, and there was sympathy for um, the nationalist movements in Egypt, anti-colonial nationalist movements there. Um, how extensive these were, I'm not sure. I know from previous research in, in um, earlier Irish nationalist movements that these tended to be sympathies that were expressed in, in a very sort of hibernocentric way, um, more of a my enemy's enemy is my friend sort of thing, rather than any coherent anti-imperialist or anti-colonial solidarity. Um, there was quite a lot of um, white supremacy um, abundant in um, even the most radical and anti-imperial uh, forms of uh, Irish nationalism in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Um, and you know, you can see this a little bit in, in the decision of Sinn Féin to really tie their, um, their international program to the concept of self-determination, which was sort of implicitly seen as uh, a white person's entitlement, uh, something that white nations in Europe should campaign for. And Ireland was included among them, but this ob obviously wasn't often extended to colonized African and Asian and other uh, peoples. That's a really good question. I'd love to know more. Yeah, I mean, that, that's, that's going to be uh, all being well the focus of your next major project, isn't it? I hope so. Yeah, in, in, in the earlier period, yes. Yeah. Hilary, thanks for the clarification. Uh, as, as suspected, not only for the Irish, but for many immigrants to Canada from countries that were once part of the British Empire, swearing an oath of loyalty to the British crown is difficult to swallow. Thank you for that, uh, for that good point. Um, I believe uh, we're a little bit, we're going to be running short of time, but I have the sense that Sean Conway, who does not use chat, wants to uh, come into the conversation. Am I correct? Yes, just with, a, with an observation and again, another wonderful presentation. As, as Shane was making his presentation, I was thinking, what would be an equivalent for such an ambassadorial success? Um, as Sir Thomas, um, um, or Sir Osmond Esmond. And the only ambassadorial su success I could imagine was Joe Kennedy in London in 1938 to 1940. I mean, if I was back at the home office, uh, I would be quite distressed. What a disaster. It just it appears just a disaster, uh, given what one would have presumably wanted. But it, but I'm, I'm not very familiar with the internal workings of the diplomatic corps, but it's a great story. But uh, thinking about uh, the task to which the subject at hand was assigned, um, it's opera boof, but it certainly uh, strikes me as a, a long, it just do, really does remind me of, uh, of Joe Kennedy in London and Franklin Roosevelt and the gang in Washington pulling their hair out at every bloody dispatch that's, uh, that, um, that they hear from the um, ambassador in London, but uh, great, great, great story. Thank you very much, Sean. We have a comment from uh, Dara um, uh, responding to Michael's question, Sinn Féin and Indigenous Peoples. Uh, De Valera's photograph has become iconic, but it was the exception among Irish nationalists. Arthur Griffith, living in South Africa during the Boer War, said nothing in favour of the Indigenous Peoples, but supported the Afrikaner movement. This, uh, I should add, is, uh, uh, is a subject that uh, Shane has been investigating intensively and extensively uh, over the past five years uh, and uh, uh, global Irish nationalism and the South African war uh, addresses that uh, directly. As I mentioned earlier, the thesis is on the cusp of completion um, and I'm very much hoping that uh, 
a published book will follow. So stay tuned, uh, Michael and Dara and everyone on, on that uh, question. Uh, there's much more to be said uh, and much more will be said. Uh, I'd like to thank you all very much uh, for uh, your participation, uh, for your questions, uh, and for your stickability, because it's not, uh, it's not easy uh, attending or indeed holding a conference online, but uh, so far so very good. So thank you to all. We're going to break for lunch. Normally we would, um, we would the pattern would be, we'd go off to a pub, uh, we, the food would be slow to arrive. Uh, we would be drinking pints of Guinness. We'd show up half an hour late and everything would be thrown out of kilter. Uh, but this time we're gonna uh, stick to the schedule and uh, we return uh, at 1.30. And uh, we return with Mark McGowan, uh, double duty, the Canadian and Irish worlds of John Joseph O'Gorman, uh, followed by Jane McGaughy on Harry Trihe, uh, the, uh, the hockey player and Hibernian, uh, the Montreal Gazette uh, and the Irish Revolution. There is plenty to come. Uh, have a good lunch and we will reconvene at 1.30. Thank you all very much indeed. Um, excellent work. Uh, see you at 1.30. Bye-bye.
Well, welcome back, everyone. We had a good lunch break. Um, Mark, uh, are you all ready to roll? That's great. Um, for those of you who've, uh, who couldn't make the morning session, uh, welcome. Uh, some very good talks, uh, but it's been, uh, I think the, the talks have been recorded and will be available, uh, I think, on YouTube. Um, but uh, Natalie Barbuzzi can give you the details on that. Um, before um, I introduce uh, Mark, I just ask those of you who have not muted uh, your speakers to please do so. Thank you very much. Hello, can I speak for one second? Yes. My, my name is uh, Ninian, N-I-N-I-A-N, and I'm using my wife's iPad. So her name is Cecile. So in, in other words, then, I seem to be slightly misidentified as Cecile when my name is Ninian. Okay. Um, oh, thank you very much, Ninian. I recognised you. It's been a long time since uh, we've met, and it's great to see you here. And uh, there's, no, there's no way I mistook you for Cecile. Okay. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank very you. Good. All right. Um, many of you will know our next speaker, uh, Mark McGowan, uh, principal of Saint Michael's College, uh, professor in the Celtic Studies program and the leading historian of the Irish in Canada. Uh, Mark has pulled off the seemingly impossible task of being an energetic and active administrator and the writer of numerous groundbreaking articles and books on the Irish in Canada. Uh, most notably, The Waning of the Green, which won the Canadian Historical Association's Clio Award, and the Ontario Historical Society's Joseph Brandt Award, uh, a biography of Michael Power, the first Catholic Bishop of Toronto, which won the Heritage Toronto Award, um, Death or Canada on Famine Migration in Toronto, uh, which was turned into a documentary uh, that is rated nine out of 10 on IMDb, uh, and most recently, The Imperial Irish, Canada's Irish Catholics fight the Great War. In the course of his research, he became fascinated by the career of the Ottawa priest and military chaplain, John Joseph O'Gorman, who was both, both an ardent imperialist and strong supporter of home rule for Ireland. And so, double duty, the Canadian and Irish worlds of JJ O'Gorman. Oh, thanks, thanks very much, David. And it, it really is a, a pleasure to be here and, and a custom break from the administrivia that's so warranted during the pandemic. And I'd like to congratulate this morning's speakers. Um, they've set the bar very, very high. And uh, uh, I really uh, enjoyed uh, all three presentations. And uh, I must say, if I don't have another chance to do so uh, this afternoon, I really want to applaud the work that David Wilson has done in being uh, moderator supreme in, in not only introducing, uh, but uh, managing each session and then uh, coordinating the, uh, the Q&A. Thanks so very much, David, for, for your work on this. And that helps make everything that much more seamless. So um, this is a, a subject I actually go back to because uh, J.J. O'Gorman seemed to feature prominently in earlier works and, and currently I'm working on Irish famine orphans as a, and in more of a social historical way. But I find that uh, these biographies have really amplified the nuances in this particular period, not just in Canada, but across uh, the Irish diaspora and in Ireland itself. So let's take a look at the, the, the only cleric, so to speak, on our list today, um, J.J. O'Gorman. And I'm going to take you uh, through uh, some of his background because I think in order to understand uh, O'Gorman, you really have to understand his roots, um, his formation, um, and his unbridled energy. This may be one of the most exhausting people I've ever had to research because he was into everything. So just to give you a... So I try to move my slides here. There we go. He was one of the Ottawa Valley O'Gormans uh, that produced priests, uh, local patriarchs, farmers, 
Um, and, and a group that really uh, became one of the dominant families. Now, his father, John Gorman, you'll note the difference, uh, was, uh, became a civil servant uh, in Ottawa, although the family originated from Douglas. And that's where this uh, 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 gravestone is, is in, is in Douglas, Ontario, in, in the Ottawa Valley. And you see probably uh, one of J.J. O'Gorman's great aunts, Joanna O'Gorman, had married a Whelan. Who, was, who has an interesting story in and of itself, which I won't mention today, but uh, good, good food for further research. One of the things about the O'Gormans is, is that um, the many gravitated toward the priesthood, the men did, and uh, many uh, showed signs as all Irish do as they come to North America is they begin to spread out. So it's no small coincidence that J.J. Uh, O'Gorman's brother eventually moves to California and his sister uh, moves uh, to Florida. And it's interesting, his brother, like himself, reclaimed the O'Gorman name officially and legally. Um, his sister does not, and she marries and, uh, and moves to Florida. Um, J.J. O'Gorman is born uh, in 1884. Uh, and there are priests as well on his mother's, on the Warnock side of the family. And all of this will make even greater sense when J.J. O'Gorman goes to war uh, and finds that he's there with several of his cousins in the Canadian chaplain service. His education is extraordinary, is extraordinary in and of itself, but also important in terms of his formation. He studied at St. Patrick's uh, Catholic School in Ottawa, then went to the University of Ottawa, which is featured here. And upon graduation, he went to Europe, studied at the University of Bonn, uh, then the University of Munich, the Institut Catholique in Paris. He also uh, attended a term at Louvain. Uh, studied in Florence, and then eventually returned to Canada to uh, uh, study for the priesthood at the Grand Seminaire de Montréal, uh, where he was ordained in Ottawa in 1908. Um, and that just gives you a sense of what kind of a philomath he was. Um, he spoke English, Irish, French, German, Italian, Spanish, Greek, and Latin. Um, and what's interesting is uh, some of his language skills were also accrued and fine-tuned when he was in Rome. Uh, he reported back to his bishop, Charles Hugotier, as he was writing his doctorate in Rome uh, in 1911, that he thought he'd just go out to Florence for the summertime and, uh, and sharpen his Italian skills, just for the fun of it. Um, What's important, I think, maybe for our talk today is that in 1904, at the age of 20, he finds himself in Ireland, as he does many times uh, during the rest of his life, and he studies Irish in the Aran Islands. Two of the people he meets on this language junket are Ian McNeil, uh, later of the Irish Volunteers, with whom he becomes uh, friends for a considerable period of time, and Padraig Pierce. Um, who he meets in Galway and uh, admires as a poet and an artist. Certainly later in his life, he does not admire uh, the, the actions taken by Pierce and others in 1916, but it's important to see that wherever he went, J.J. Um, uh, O'Gorman created uh, a network. Um, when he re finally returns to the Diocese of Ottawa in 1912, he's stationed at uh, the parish of St. Philip, which is the, uh, uh, the small 19th century church you see on your slide here uh, with, the, with the red uh, uh, belfry steeple. Interesting because in 1912, I mean, this was a mixed community uh, with a very large uh, orange lodge and with a history from the mid 19th century of burning one another's churches. Uh, obviously, Saint, this iteration of St. Philip survived. He's moved then to actually establish a parish in a growing suburb of Ottawa, which everyone who knows Ottawa today would be surprised was a suburb in uh, 1913, and that's the Glebe neighborhood. Uh, near the uh, Rideau Canal, uh, a rather leafy collection of streets, and he was tasked with founding a new Catholic parish there, and that essentially became his, his ecclesial home for the rest of his life, the Blessed Sacrament, which you see there uh, on the, uh, uh, the left side of your screen. I want to enumerate what I think are five fundamental influences on the way in which O'Gorman's thinking is shaped. And the first we've heard somewhat in our talks this morning, and that is the relationships and often stormy ones between Irish and French Canadian Catholics. 
Um, of course, uh, this particular graphic comes from 1896, where you see uh, a dead stereotypical Irishman on a stretcher between an Anglo-Protestant Canadian uh, at the back and a French Canadian at the front. But within many regions of Canada, Irish migrants found themselves as a double minority, uh, a minority linguistically uh, within their own church and a minority in terms of uh, their religion among the, the English language group, which, which dominated the rest of the country outside of Quebec. Oftentimes what you see is when that double minority feature uh, is, is, is profound, that the badge of Irishness becomes the one that replaces both language and religion. And it, it helps for us to account why some parts of the country have a much more profound Irish nationalism than others. And Montreal would be a case in point. And in some cases, Ottawa uh, and parts of New Brunswick would also account for it. O'Gorman was sensitive to this. He was fluently bilingual as we we've already learned, but he jousted repeatedly with French Canadian clergy uh, in Ottawa over the question of who should dominate Catholic schools. O'Gorman took a very strong Anglophone stance, uh, particularly against what he thought were inferior teachers coming out of Quebec. Uh, and he also was worried the fact that as the French began to dominate not only his alma mater, the University of Ottawa, but also uh, the, the Ottawa uh, Catholic School Board uh, that, uh, Anglophones would flee uh, to what he considered the Protestant public education system. Um, these conflicts elevated uh, in his early priesthood so much so that it drove his bishop, who is Charles Hugotier, and despite his surname was perhaps more Celtic because his mother was a McKinnon, uh, and uh, he was caught in between the jousts between O'Gorman and a host of, of French-speaking Catholic priests and their paper Le Droit. Um, in fact, Gautier has had enough by the beginning of World War I that he silences all of his priests in talking about issues of language and religion in the public press. But the real target here is O'Gorman. Say the second influence on his formation um, is his relationship with the Orange Lodge, which is certainly um, not terribly friendly uh, throughout his priesthood. Um, I chose this photograph quite deliberately because this is still an active lodge in Richmond, Ontario, where his first parish was. This is LOL 151, uh, and uh, they still meet uh, in this particular building. Uh, but from his early development, both in the Ottawa Valley and, uh, and certainly uh, in Richmond, um, he began uh, to, to, how shall we say, raise refutations uh, to whatever the Orange Sentinel uh, was to write about Catholics, whatever Orangemen were to say about Catholic schools or about uh, essentially Catholic uh, rights that weren't really rights at all, but were privileges. That would be a second influence. The third is Irish constitutional nationalism. Um, and I, 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 I sneak this photograph in for Padre Gauchil because this is actually the charitable Irish society of Halifax marching in the streets. Um, one of the fellows who's blocked out by the text of this slide is actually carrying a union jack. Um, but what O'Gorman becomes, I think, certainly uh, receptive to is the idea of home rule. And that is that, Ireland should have what Canada has, and he will write repeatedly what Australia has as well, and that is uh, constitutional autonomy within the larger British Empire. And this becomes a major influence in his thinking, as we will see. I think the fourth influence is something that's been mentioned before today, and that is what I would call Episcopal imperialism in Canada. And actually, this is a photograph of the aforementioned uh, Cornelius O'Brien, the, the uncle of uh, Catherine Hughes, who was uh, Archbishop of Halifax from 1882 to 1906. And we do learn that he was a member of the Imperial Federation League, an ordained imperialist, but he was not alone. And three bishops that I list there, Michael Francis Fallon, of whom you will hear in a, in a few minutes in my talk, uh, the Bishop of London, uh, James T. McNally, Bishop of Calgary, then Bishop of Hamilton, and then 
ironically Bishop of Halifax, and Neil McNeil, uh, the Archbishop of Toronto, will all be very influential and, how should we say, supportive allies as O'Gorman moves his ideas with regard to Irish uh, Irish independence, Irish autonomy forward. Don't be fooled by McNeil. Some will say, oh, he was a Cape Bretoner. His mother was a Maher and they were from uh, County Kilkenny. So uh, uh, McNeil, if anything, was, was a hybrid Celt uh, that way. And the final influence, I think, is his aversion uh, to physical force nationalism. Uh, and that becomes very clear in his early writings and certainly his later writings during uh, our period uh, in question. And just for those who haven't seen it, when you visit the campus of the University of Toronto, this is a monument to those who resisted the Fenians at Limestone Ridge or Ridgeway, uh, uh, actually students at University College. So I threw that in just as a novelty. Now, in 1914, of course, when Britain is at war, Canada is at war, and we see our friend O'Gorman uh, right here. Uh, this is a gathering of Catholic chaplains in France in 1918. Uh, and this, of course, is Bishop Michael Francis Fallon, who had taken responsibility for recruitment of chaplains in Canada uh, at the beginning of the war. Now, what's interesting is, is that O'Gorman writes to his bishop and he says, in this warlike time, it is very difficult for a young priest to know whether he would render a greater service to God and country as an overseas chaplain than as a priest at home. And while I am unable to decide this question in my own case, I want to assure your grace that if or any time during the war you wish my service as an army chaplain, I shall be ready at a moment's notice. Somewhat ironic, he writes this in November of 1915, um, just as he is publishing a sermon called Render Unto Caesar, which appears in January 1916, where he comments on the absolute necessity for Catholics, regardless of language, uh, to fight as he, uh, in this war. He says, war, however, imposes an additional duty on the citizen, the duty of protecting the sovereign rights of the state endangered by our enemy. Our duty is to fight for victory and to pray for peace. The whole British empire must mobilize its every force if we are to defend uh, what is ours. And the interesting irony here is, is that he submits this for the imprimatur of Charles Hugoche, his bishop, who refuses only to have Goche shocked when his colleague, Bishop McNeil, featured here of Toronto, publishes it verbatim as render unto Caesar. I think that was enough cause for Goche to say, I think it's time for you to get out of the diocese and be a chaplain. Um, so uh, in a sense, uh, O'Gorman had written his own uh, ticket on this one. He actually joins, so this is a poster from the 199th Montreal, which also recruited in Eastern Ontario, and he becomes a chaplain uh, in uh, early 1916 at the rank of honorary captain in the 199th, uh, but eventually serves uh, uh, in Europe uh, with, uh, uh, with the first, uh, the third brigade of the first division. Um, this is a picture of, of Fallon with whom he shared uh, many of his ideas. One of the things that, that comes to, uh, to, to O'Gorman when he's there is something unfortunate. He, he arrives, uh, is separated from the 199th um, because uh, the 199th and the 208th Toronto Irish battalions with dozens of others are broken up. Uh, upon arrival so that their bodies can fill the existing divisions and battalions uh, that are in great need on the Western Front. Um, O'Gorman ends up uh, in France uh, and is wounded in action, removing uh, uh, bodies uh, from no man's land and the wounded. Um, his arm is shattered, um, his hand is mobile, he gets shrapnel in his buttocks and in his right leg, uh, and it looks like the war is over. Interestingly enough, it's not over for O'Gorman. He goes back to Ottawa and is recuperating on Water Street in Ottawa uh, and begins to question uh, many Irish Canadians who are saying in the wake of, of what happened at Easter in 1916, perhaps we should hold back 
our service to the British Empire uh, in fighting, because obviously the British Empire doesn't care about small nations being free because it's shackling uh, Ireland at this time. And he writes in the Ottawa Citizen, we should consider the double duty of Irish Canadians, the duty he owes to Ireland, the duty he owes to Canada. There are some Irish of Irish descent in Canada, pure and simple say it, Ireland was indeed the land of our ancestors, but it is not our land and consequently we have nothing whatsoever to do with it. This claim we Irish Canadians cannot admit. Ireland has bequeathed to us in addition to the Catholic faith of St. Patrick, an intellectual, moral and emotional artistic inheritance, which is of the highest spiritual value. It is our right, it is our duty to know Ireland's history Canada is indeed our native land, but Ireland is our fatherland and will all nearer and dearer as we will be second to none in 1917. And he goes on to say in that particular missive, the few voices that are raised here and there asking that we should halt until Ireland gets home rule have rightly been disregarded by the vast majority of Irish Canadians. We do not intend to do wrong that good may come. No matter how unjust the policy of England is towards Ireland, we shall not change, for our patriotism is the result, not of the changing conduct of individuals or institutions, but of principles as unchanging as our Catholic faith. Here is really that, that bifocal mind uh, of, of uh, J.J. O'Gorman. On the one hand, fiercely Canadian and fiercely loyal to the British Empire, and yet on the other hand, not denying his Irish self, and, and certainly putting forward proposals for an Ireland, much similar to those of, of Archbishop Fallon, that would see Ireland remain uh, as an autonomous uh, country within uh, the, the British Empire. Um, He's also fighting the French Canadian battles when he goes back home. So he picks up where he left off. And I just wanted to mention this um, uh, on the Feast of Corpus Christi, as he's recuperating in the Water Street Hospital in Ottawa, um, uh, a French Canadian nun tears down his Irish flag that he's put outside his window alongside the French tricolor, the Union Jack, and the Canadian ensign. He thought that during the Corpus Christi parade, he's, uh, parade, he said, Ireland, the most Catholic nation in the world, cannot be excommunicated from a Corpus Christi procession by the decree of an excited French Canadian nun. And of course, this becomes big news in Ottawa because once again, he's showing he's still fighting his Canadian battles. And yet at the same time, he wants Ireland represented distinctively as Catholics celebrate this grace feast of, of Corpus Christi. Uh, and it becomes quite a cause celeb uh, in, uh, uh, in Ottawa. While recuperating, he uses all of his Ottawa connections to essentially uh, remove what he considers orangeism at the head of the Canadian Chaplain Corps. Um, the individual with the pipe uh, on the, uh, the right-hand side of your screen is C.J. Doherty, Irish Catholic Member of Parliament for one of the Montreal constituencies. He knows O'Gorman. O'Gorman has a vast network of politicians in Ottawa, which he pulls. Uh, and eventually, uh, Richard Stacey, the head of the Canadian Chaplain Service, and allied with Sam Hughes, the former Minister of Militia, is removed. The chaplaincy service is reorganized uh, with a, a greater degree of equity between Protestant and Catholic service personnel. So again, here he is wounded severely, according to medical reports, and yet still using his networks to foster uh, what, uh, what he sees as an appropriate agenda. Um, he also becomes key in the creation of the Catholic army huts, which are open to all, and these become recreation centers in France and England and in Canada for Canadian service personnel. And he actually now returns to Europe upon uh, recovery, is reactivated, uh, and becomes one of the chief exponents of uh, this program run essentially by the Canadian uh, Catholic chaplains. Now, in the post-war period, um, his most famous pronunciation uh, is uh, a speech he gives on the eve of St. Patrick's Day uh, in 1920. And as you can see, once again, uh, Ireland, uh, since the Larne gun running, um, is, is given a forward by another ally, uh, Bishop Michael Francis Fallon. So again, this idea of networking, which we've seen now with others in the talks today. Um, 
I'm just going to highlight some of the things that he says in this particular uh, talk, which uh, the Ottawa Citizen reports people have packed in to hear him because he's very eloquent. And secondly, they're applauding on every uh, major piece uh, of information that he gives them. So what is he saying to them? Well, first of all, he identifies himself as being, he said, as being Canadian. He said, I hold no brief with any party in Ireland. I am neither unionist, a nationalist, or a Sinn Féinor. I am a Canadian. Canada is my nation, and under the king I owe uh, and own allegiance to no other. The ties that bind me and most other Canadians of Irish blood to Ireland are profound, but they are not political. Ireland, I look upon as a sister nation quite capable as Canada in managing her own affairs. So he stakes out his territory, although I must say, the more you read this particular pamphlet, the more you realize that he still has, has essentially attached his colors uh, to John Redmond uh, and that home rule tradition. On unity, he says, the fact that there is in Ireland, as there has been in every subject nation in history, a minority planted there by a conqueror, enjoying political ascendancy and opposed to the national aspirations, does not change the fact that this minority in Ireland is Irish and hence part of the Irish nation, the Irish people, like every other civilized nation, has the right of national self-determination. Very interesting, very harsh words uh, for, for, for Great Britain. And we see this consistently, yet this man holds the order of the British Empire for his service uh, in World War I. And much of this goes unchecked by the, uh, the press in Ottawa at the time. Relationship between Ireland and Canada. He says, realizing the economic and other advantages that would accrue to Ireland had she, relative to the empire, the political position of Canada or Australia, four-fifths of the Irish people during the past two generations worked for home rule. An Irish Republic, there is nothing sinful or inherently wrong with this. What is a noble idea in Canada cannot be an innoble idea in Ireland. And I think this is a really important proviso is that many constitutional nationalists at the time may have eschewed uh, the position of Catherine Hughes, but here, uh, O'Gorman is saying, I'm not going to rule it out. And, and he particularly doesn't rule it out because of the, the, the victory by Sinn Féin MPs in, in the recent election uh, in Ireland. So this is an interesting twist in, in what had been uh, a, a fairly consistent home rule uh, policy. Here again, strong words. And this is why the two worlds, the two minds of O'Gorman are so fascinating. He said, looking at conscription, the question at a distance of time and space, it's not hard to justify Ireland's resistance. I was in the British House of Commons, he seems to be everywhere, uh, when it was introduced. And I felt that a greater blow had been struck at the British Empire by this action of Lloyd George and his Tories than by the German defeat of the Fifth Army, which was its alleged excuse. There are only two ways of governing a nation, by consent of the governed or by Prussianism. To have enforced conscription in Ireland would have been the same as Prussianism. And again, no holds barred in terms of how he deals with the Lord George administration, never assaults the crown, by the way. And uh, uh, I would also point out that he was also a supporter of conscription in Canada. Why? because it was put to the electorate of Canada in that ill-fated election of December, 1917. And finally on partition, um, interestingly enough, he referred to the proposed partition of Ireland as creating a divided Ireland of Ireland and Carsonshire, as he called it. Um, I appeal to all who care for the British Empire, to all who support democracy and hate ascendancy, to all who cherish patriotism and love liberty, to support the just, national demand of an undivided Ireland for a government of her own choice, for it is imperative that the cruel martial law in Ireland with the unlawful reprisals it provokes should forthwith cease. It is imperative not merely for the sake of Ireland, not merely for the sake of England, not merely for the sake of the British Empire, but also for the sake of the whole league of civilized nations, for no flags are fair if freedom's flag be unfurled. And I must say that uh, when you look at the Ottawa Journal, uh, the conservative paper in the, in the town, uh, the Ottawa Citizen, 
uh, as, uh, as they report on this speech, there are no critiques. In fact, they report much of the speech, uh, the most important sections of the speech verbatim uh, and, and highlight uh, how the crowd uh, has responded to it. Now, interestingly enough, uh, when the, uh, the League uh, for uh, the Self-Determination of Ireland meets in Ottawa, um, O'Gorman seems to be mysteriously absent, um, even though many of the ideas generated at, at that convention would have been very close to his own. Although I did a little bit of snooping around and he did say mass within the context of, uh, the, uh, of the convention and who should appear as a, a, not a participant, but at least an, a witness to the mass is Lindsay Crawford himself. Um, Many of the people who speak at the convention are friends of O'Gorman's, but I suspect that the bishop just wanted to rein O'Gorman in, uh, lest it be further embarrassment for him uh, should he create yet another controversy well, within the diocese. So in closing, just to give you a sense that, you know, his indefatigable life also included the attempt which David Wilson has accomplished now of trying to write a biography of Thomas Darcy McGee. Um, he did write a major paper on McGee published in 1925. It was a speech that he had given, but that was the same year that Skelton's biography came out. And I suspect all of his research then uh, was, was shelved so that he could go on uh, to other projects. And in fact, uh, his, uh, his papers uh, were directed to uh, the, the National Archives now, the Dominion Archives then in 1933, where of course, one of his good friends was the associate archivist, James Francis Kenny, another Irish Catholic and founder of the Canadian Catholic Historical Association. Never end, I just, I am almost breathless by how much he undertook in the post-war period while all of the Irish uh, challenges were facing him. Founding the, of the Ottawa Boys and Girls Club, one of the founders of Immaculata High School, one of the founders of St. Patrick's College, the founder of the Ottawa Gaelic League, member of Knights of Columbus Council 485, uh, participant and a chairman of the Catholic Truth Society, part of the Seminarians Aid Club, one of the founders of St. Patrick's Home, which still exists in Ottawa. There seemed to be no end uh, to his, his energies except the fact that he was rushed to hospital uh, in April of 1933 with a ruptured appendix, and he died uh, at the age of 49 uh, with, uh, uh, with what is likely uh, peritonitis. Um, both newspapers in Ottawa commented quite favorably. I'll just give you a couple of snippets here. One of Canada's most brilliant English-speaking Catholic priests, um, although deeply interested in the affairs of Ireland, Dr. O'Gorman was a staunch supporter of the British Commonwealth, and above all, he was one who upheld every respect the traditions of the dominion in which he was born. Just to give you a sense of the, of the type of, of support that he had in Ottawa throughout his career, when he was wounded in Europe in 1916, um, Robert Borden sent a cable to check uh, on his health. So the prime minister was even engaged with J.J. O'Gorman. Um, uh, a life cut short, a life of what would seemingly be contradictions. Uh, but uh, for J.J. O'Gorman, I think he reinforces in me um, perhaps um, the subtle nuances of, of Irish nationalism in this period in Canada, the differences held by various Irish Canadian individuals on the Irish affair, but also the com complexities that at least one or more uh, battled with, um, that there are no binaries in this particular case of, of, of Irish nationalism. I think um, there are interesting subtle nuances. And here I kind of pull back from positions I took maybe uh, 20 some odd years ago in my first book, The Waning of the Green, that seemed to be a bit more clear cut on this. I think J.J. O'Gorman uh, helps us explore these varying shades of gray. And with that, I leave you. Well, thank you very much indeed, Mark. Um, uh, as with this morning's uh, talks, uh, please feel free to uh, uh, type your questions into uh, chat and uh, when they come out, I will uh, read them out uh, accordingly. So uh, please go ahead and do that. Um, meanwhile, um, one second while I just get this back in shape. 
uh, while I'm waiting for the first uh, chat questions to come through. Um, some comments, um, Mark, a very, very interesting paper about uh, uh, a man whose energy rivals your own, I would say, actually. Um, and uh, I found J.J. Um, uh, O'Gorman's notes for the biography he was going to write on Thomas Darcy Begee immensely uh, useful for uh, my own project, because one of the things that, uh, that O'Gorman did was send out letters to people who knew McGee. Uh, and uh, some of the replies are absolutely fascinating uh, because they, they uh, present vivid portraits of an evening of drinking and arguing with Darcy McGee or an evening at Darcy McGee's house, that kind of thing. Uh, sources that otherwise would have been uh, lost to the record and certainly sources that were never used in Isabel Skelton's uh, hagiographical uh, biography uh, of McGee. Our first question is coming through now uh, from uh, Liz Smith. Uh, thanks, Mark. Any association with the women religious? I think your assessment certainly parallels uh, the activities of the uh, C CSJs and IBVMs in Toronto, Sister uh, Austin Warnock, uh, CSJ. Any relation? That's a good question, Liz. Um, and in fact, you know, with <laughs> the, the talk is just a tip of a massive iceberg um, created by O'Gorman, but he was very close uh, to the Gray, si Gray Sisters, actually, uh, in Pembroke. And, uh, and they were going through their own uh, turmoil vis-a-vis -vis their relationship with the Sœur Grise uh, of Ottawa and uh, the Sœur de Charité, the Sœur Grise in Montreal. And again, these French English tensions and uh, he was quite a strong ally uh, of the Greys. And in fact, um, uh, the Greys wrote of him after his death uh, and they collaborated in um, the, the foundation of Immaculata High School. I mean, I should not let it be unsaid uh, that it was really the Grey sisters of Pembroke that, uh, that founded and, and uh, ran Immaculata High School. But the agent there for them was J.J. O'Gorman who who paved the way for them to come back to the city as an Anglophone uh, version of the Sœur de Charité to, to run that institution, which by the way, uh, still exists in Ottawa uh, today. I'm not sure about Sister Austin Warnock. I'd have to look that one up. I know that there was a, a Father Warnock, uh, but uh, um, interesting question. I'll have to ask Linda Wicks about that at the CSJ archives. All right, do we have any uh, more questions coming up? I, I, while we're waiting for that, I would um, ask you, Mark, to reflect a little more on um, on J.J. O'Gorman's apparent openness to an Irish Republic, presumably uh, grounded in the, uh, as well, you suggest, grounded in the electoral victory of Sinn Féin. Um, electoral victories meant a lot to him. That, that explains the apparent contradiction in his views about conscription in Canada and Ireland. Um, but in being open to an Irish Republic, um, that uh, shifts him from the Redmondite position that he'd previously occupied. Yeah, and I think that, David, that's the most surprising thing about this talk that he gives at St. Patrick's Hall. And, and I, I do think it's linked to his strong belief in participatory democracy. Um, which reflects his position on conscription, but also, you know, in looking at the election results in Ireland, looking at how the Irish Parliamentary Party, the Home Rulers, you know, fell apart after Redmond's death, uh, and uh, that he saw that if the Irish people, who were to be the final judges of how they were to be ruled, uh, determined that they should be, uh, you know, working in the direction of a republic, um, that would be something that he could accept. It's not something he wanted, but it would be something he would he would accept, um, which would have put him, you know, not necessarily in constant sympathy with Catherine Hughes, because I, 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 I don't know if he he probably knew Hughes, but they probably disliked one another because each had a very strong personality. Um, but I think that in this particular case, that if, if the Irish people uh, opted for a, a Republican solution, uh, he would, uh, he would, he would accept that. 
Um, the interesting thing is he was, he was pro-treaty, as were many uh, Irish Canadian clerics at the time. The clerical nationalism here was still rooted there. I would say probably where you saw some dissent uh, in those ranks are among some of the priests of the Diocese of Kingston, who, by the way, actually owned uh, the Canadian freemen uh, at the time. So um, some variants there. And they, actually, his double duty speech did receive a negative comment in the Freeman from a letter to the editor. So, I mean, it does show you that, uh, you know, O'Gorman didn't represent, you know, every uh, Irish Catholic Canadian or every Irish Catholic cleric at the time. So very, very briefly, before going to the questions, uh, that letter of dissent came from which direction? That there was too much on Canada or too much on Ireland? Uh, no, the letter of dissent said that O'Gorman was all wrong about double duty that uh, we, should, we should cut off the recruitment right now and that the British should come, come clean on home rule and uh, award it before we had put any more troops in battle. I see. Okay, yeah. thank you. Interesting. Uh, and from Ro Ronald Gillis, um, was he censored or restricted by the Catholic Church in what he published? Specifically, the seeming neutrality the Church has historically taken in matters of war and government? Good question. Um, in fact, uh, uh, fair play to uh, Charles Gautier, because when they could have censored him uh, initially, they didn't uh, at the beginning of the war. In 1915, the, the, the bishops of Ottawa, Montreal, and Quebec issued a pastoral uh, in support of the Canadian war effort, uh, the British uh, imperial war effort. Henri Bourassa uh, responded quite strongly against it, but in a in veiled language, because Bourassa himself was a devout Catholic. And here we have an actually interesting private and public correspondence between uh, between O'Gorman and Bourassa, and uh, refuting one another point by point. And I, oh, it seems as though Gautier, who is a signatory to this pastoral, allows enough leash until other French Canadian priests get in, and then he shuts them all down. Um, the render unto Caesar actually was uh, uh, was the refusal of Gauthier to support that was actually because uh, the censor for the Archdiocese of Ottawa felt that there was some, uh, how should we say, heterodox doctrine uh, thrown into it. Um, obviously, it wasn't heterodox for McNeil because he published it almost verbatim. So, um, yeah, it's uh, an interesting question. Thank you. Uh, from uh, Marilyn Driscoll, uh, Irish Canadian Cultural Association of New Brunswick. Welcome uh, from New Brunswick, Marilyn. Uh, what would have been the influence, if any, of O'Gorman's of O'Gorman opinions on other Catholic chaplains of the time, such as the Reverend B.J. Mordock, uh, author of The Red Vineyard, his own experiences as a military chaplain in the First World War? Yes, I've actually read Murdoch's uh, book, which is which is quite illuminating. But um, O'Gorman would have known almost all of the of the Catholic chaplains because of his uh, subsequent uh, uh, leadership in the Catholic army huts, uh, and particularly those chaplains like Murdoch, who sometimes were uh, at the front and sometimes were uh, behind the lines uh, in the camps in uh, the UK. So. Uh, uh, O'Gorman would have known them. Um, he doesn't really express all that much in terms of opinions of them, although I, I, he had a, such a strong relationship that when he died in 1933, his six pallbearers were all former Catholic chaplains, one of whom had uh, come into Ottawa from Glace Bay, Nova Scotia. So it, uh, he, there was obviously a strong bond uh, between uh, that particular group. And here's an irony for, of that group of English uh, speaking Catholic chaplains of World War I, not one of them becomes a bishop after the war, unlike in World War II. Uh, and some, ex some claim, and I haven't seen enough uh, physical evidence of this, is that it's because they got along so well with many of the Protestant chaplains in the field um, that they were always uh, under suspicion thereafter. So it. Uh... Right. Um, from uh, Paul Shiel, uh, more a comment than a question. The charitable Irish in Halifax are still singing God Save the Queen and God Save Ireland uh, at their annual banquet or at least they were in the 1990s. My question back to you, Podrick, would be, um, uh, are they singing the fields of Athen Rye yet? I was at their uh, banquet in 2015 and they were singing still, but not Athen Rye. All right, <laughs> it's just a matter of time. Uh, from Shane Lynn, 
a fascinating individual. His career and philosophy share a lot of parallels with his contemporary, father, later bishop, Henry William Cleary of New Zealand, another imperialist and colonial integrationist intellectual who enjoyed sparring with orange opinions. Also a war chaplain on the Western Front and a strong home ruler. The difference is clearly, clearly never softened on Irish republicanism. Any uh, thoughts on that, Mark? Fascinating parallel. I mean, I, you know, if I had another life, I'd be wanting to write a book on uh, Irish Catholic chaplains in the diaspora because so many appear, including Newfoundlanders and uh, 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 Aussies with the uh, with the Anzacs. But I'm not surprised in in the transnational work uh, research that I've done since uh, you find a lot of parallels, and that O'Gorman would have been very popular in those ward rooms as well. Uh, in uh, uh, among other uh, imperial troops. Okay, there's still time, Mark, there's still time. Oh, jeez. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, finally, uh, from uh, Richard Carter, how were O'Gorman's nuanced views on Irish home rule, supportive of both Irish nationalism and the Commonwealth, received by the Irish Canadian community? Good question, Richard. And uh, he was, as I say, I mean, not everyone agreed with him. Um, that would be unusual. And uh, he probably would have preferred to argue with those who didn't, but a, a great majority of the people um, that he dealt with, he packed halls um, when he spoke. Um, he, not only because of his eloquence, but because of the message that he was, he was giving. And even somebody as, uh, as ornery as Father Whelan at St. Patrick's Parish, whom he would disagree with on a number of things, Imperial uh, would still invite him to speak. Um, there would be others uh, that, uh, and as I, I mentioned, the Canadian Freeman, there were letters to the editor uh, protesting O'Gorman. But just to give you a sense of how well he was honored by the Irish uh, Catholic community in Ottawa and Protestants is that at his funeral, I mentioned the, the Catholic chaplains as his um, uh, pallbearers, but there were so many people who wanted to get into a Blessed Sacrament Church that couldn't, that there was a huge crowd of people uh, outside, uh, you know, uh, just hoping that they could hear something going on inside or just to be in attendance where this, this man went down. Um, the pastor of the Anglican parish close by, which is still close by, St. Matthew's, wrote a tribute to him as well from the Protestant community. He was, he was so very well respected in many of the, not just the Irish community, the only community that certainly wouldn't have much to do with him is the French Canadian, Franco Ontarian uh, community yeah. with, uh, with whom he had uh, quite the history. Um, yeah, and in, in many respects, uh, Mark, he reminds me of Father Dowd from Montreal. A uh, very similar mindset. And of course, Dowd and McGee were very close to each other, which fits with uh, O'Gorman. Uh, we have a postscript from uh, Julia Armstrong, the supervisory editor at the Dictionary of Canadian Bi Biography, uh, pointing out that the Dictionary of Canadian Biography has an entry on O'Gorman by one Dr. Mark McGowan uh, that you should definitely consult. Uh, and someone else. Um, uh, from today is also featured in the Dictionary of Canadian Biography, and that's Catherine Hughes. Uh, her biography was, uh, the, the entry on her uh, was written by Porigo Scheel. And uh, the Dictionary of Canadian Biography will be publishing uh, biographies of Robert Lindsay Crawford uh, and Harry Trihe. So stay tuned. Uh, they, they, uh, are, uh, they have not yet been assigned, um, but uh, they are uh, definitely on our list. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Mark, for a, a, another very stimulating talk in, uh, in today's conference. Uh, I mentioned Henry Trihe coming up um, and, uh, uh, and uh, closing the conference, uh, we have Jane McGaughy, a former um, student in the Celtic Studies program, and we in Celtic Studies take full credit for all her accomplishments, uh, <laughs> <laughs> which are many, which are many. Uh, we're going to take a 10 minute break. Um, it's uh, just before 2.20. We'll reconvene at uh, 2.30 uh, for uh, our final talk and Q&A, uh, this time on Harry Trahi. Thank you very much, and I'll see you then.
Welcome back, everyone. Um, Jane, are you uh, good to go? All right, excellent. Um, one second, my computer is just playing up. Stop playing up, good. Uh, we are delighted to welcome you back, Jane. Um, Jane is, as I mentioned earlier, one of our former students, um, and we're very proud of her. Uh, she's currently the Johnson Chair of Quebec and Canadian Irish Studies at Concordia University, and formerly uh, the President of the Canadian Association for Irish Studies. After her time at the University of Toronto, um, Jane did her PhD at uh, Birkbeck College, University of London, thus adroitly avoiding the hell of comprehensive examinations with which we torment our own graduate students. Mm -hmm. <laughs> her thesis paved the way for her first book, Ulster's Men, Protestant Union, Unionist Masculinities and Militarization in the North of Ireland, 1912 to 23. Described by Keith Jeffrey as an important and pioneering work that comprised a stimulating and refreshing analysis of a crucially important period. The second book, Violent Loyalties, Manliness, Migration and the Irish in Canada, 1798 to 1841, is not only the first gendered examination of male Irish migration to Canada, but also the first book to recognize the deep influence that the rising of 1798 had in Irish Canadian history. More recently, Jane has become interested in the hockey star, Hibernian and battalion commander of the Irish Canadian Rangers. No masculinity there, right, Jane? No. <laughs> Whose activities during the Irish Revolution intersected with those of Robert Lindsay Crawford and Catherine Hughes, and for aught I know, with uh, J.J. O'Gorman and Osmond Esmond as well. Jane, it's great to have you here. Thank you so much, David. Um, I just wanna offer my thanks to begin with to you and to everyone organizing the conference. It was a delight to get the uh, invitation to participate. It's always fun to, to be able to come back to an alma mater and hopefully maybe next year or a year after uh, a trip to Toronto will be a little bit more feasible than it is now. Um, I also want to thank uh, Gabrielle machnik kakezi for all of her help with uh, some of the research for this paper. Um, and I think, I hope that you all find that it dovetails nicely with what we just heard from Mark about J.J. Orgorman, um, who was certainly someone that Harry Trihe knew quite well um, going into uh, the war years and certainly coming out of them as well. Uh, let me see here. On Tuesday, July 3rd, 1917, the Gazette of Montreal ran a headline on its second page describing the views expressed one day earlier by Lieutenant Colonel Harry J. Trihe to the New York Evening Post. While much of the Gazette's coverage focused on Trihe's position regarding the looming specter of the Canadian conscription crisis and the fact that Trihe had written for an American newspaper rather than a Canadian press, the end of the column included his, quote, reasons for discontent. Trihe's anger in 1917 with the fate of his regiment, the Irish Canadian Rangers, was well known in Montreal and across the country. Upon arriving in England at the end of 1916, as we had heard from Mark earlier, the regiment heavily recruited from Irish Montreal had been informed that it would be disbanded and its soldiers scattered among English Canadian regiments rather than serving together as they had been promised when signing up. Even more insulting for Trihe, and an act that resulted in his resignation as commanding officer of the Rangers was that before being broken up, the regiment was to be paraded through Ireland as an example of diasporic loyalty to the allies. This had been too much for Trahi and he had resigned his commission on January 10th. But his article for the evening post later that year reframed his actions as something directly tied to revolutionary Ireland. Trahi believed that the rights of small nations rather than pronounce loyalty to king okay. or empire. Yes. Sorry? Is everything all right? Sorry, could everyone please uh, make sure that they are muted? Okay, Carry thank on. you. Um, Trahi believed that the rights of small nations rather than pronounce loyalty to king or empire had been the main motivating factor behind the creation of the ICR. And you can see the uh, recruiting picture here. He reminded his audience that this first poster in 1916 quoted the legend, small nations must be free. 
The particular appeal, he argued, was to these who desired to share in the honor of representing in this unit, Irish Canadian loyalty to Canada at the front, fighting for the principle proclaimed on the poster. Sadly for Trahi, this was not to be. Today, he wrote, the Irish Canadian knows the fate of the Irish Canadian regiment that Irish Canadian loyalty organized to symbolize itself in Canada's effort for the freedom of small nations. He realizes what he formerly heard, but did not appreciate, that Ireland is under martial law and is occupied by an English army. He reads in the press that English soldiers in Dublin and in Cork with rifle and with machine gun fight those of his kinsmen who believe Ireland to be a small nation worthy of freedom. He wonders if the conscripting of 100,000 more Canadians would still be necessary if the 150,000 men comprising the English army in Ireland were sent to fight in France. He also wonders where Canadians now may best maintain the war purpose vital to Canada. Small nations must be free. Harry J. Trahi was one of the most famous former hockey players in the country, captaining the Montreal Shamrocks at the turn of the century to two Stanley Cup victories. I teach about him every year in my Irish in Montreal class, and I once made the mistake of describing him as a center forward like Wendell Clark or Doug Gilmore, giving away which hockey team I cheer for, which is not the Habs, and making me, uh, I might have gotten a couple boos from my undergrads at that point. During and after his hockey career, Trihe became one of the best known Irish Catholics in Montreal. With his hockey record, no one seemed to blame him for being born in Ontario. He had been an extremely popular choice to head up recruitment of the ICRs, as despite his post-hockey legal career and elite address along the boulevard in Westmount, he was a hero to the Irish Montrealers of all classes, and especially the working class community in Griffintown. According to Robin Burns' classic article, The Montreal Irish and the Great War, Canadian military authorities were incensed at Trihe, believing that his letter to the Evening Post was tantamount to sedition. C.J. Doherty, the Minister of Justice and MP for St. Anne's riding in Montreal, had to personally intervene in order to prevent any action being taken against the former Lieutenant Colonel. Historian Matthew Barlow highlights that Trihe had to be aware of the controversial nature of his final comments, as he would have known that Montreal papers would reprint the Post's article. Trihe positioned the Irish of Canada as Canadians first, but very explicitly highlighted the 150,000 English, and pointedly not British, but English soldiers occupying Ireland in 1917, pitting their numbers directly against the 100,000 Prime Minister Borden hoped to raise through conscription in Canada. As Barlow puts it, even if Trihe was a member of the Irish Catholic elite of Montreal, his letter reflected a common point of view of the Irish in Montreal. Barlow offers that no simple conclusion can be drawn regarding the behavior of the Irish Catholics of Griffintown during the war. What I want to explore this afternoon is that something similar can be said regarding the Gazette's position on Irish affairs between 1919 and 1921. Despite the newspaper's current incarnation as basically a center-right publication and one of only two daily Anglophone newspapers in Quebec, the Gazette's coverage of the Irish War of Independence era shows tremendous volatility in its remarks, veering from outright condemnation of the IRA to wistful longing for a Redmanite home rule position to notable sympathies for the armed struggle against the British that mirror in many ways Trihe's point of view in 1917. This fluctuating bias in Montreal's longest lasting English language newspaper is an intriguing phenomenon that continues what Burns and Barlow have explored regarding the loyalties and opinions of 20th century Irish Montreal. A few caveats before I begin going through some of the specific headlines and articles that appeared in the Gazette during these years. This is still very much an early work in progress because I haven't been able to be inside of an archive since December of 2019. Uh, ideally, I would have been able to put what I'm going to show you from the Gazette in conversation with two other very notable English language Montreal newspapers from the late 1910s the Montreal Star and the Montreal Herald, so that we could compare and contrast the city's coverage of the Irish Revolutionary period as a whole, and also its insights about members of its own Irish communities. Unfortunately, the Star and the Herald have not yet been digitized. So my impressions of the Gazette will be in something of a vacuum. 
This is also by no means an exhaustive demonstration of the Gazette's coverage of Ireland between 1919 and 21. It's just a tiny taste of the newspaper's contents in the hopes that someday someone will do a deeper dive. Every year I do point out to uh, my undergrads that this would be a brilliant MA topic, but so far no one has taken me up on that challenge. So what I hope to show you today merely whets your appetite for a little bit more from Montreal. On the 1st of January, 1919, the Gazette ran a story on Sinn Féin and the 1918 general election. The Sinn Féin will make the most of the sensational victories it achieved outside of Ulster and the 78 Sinn Féin members will meet in Dublin and constitute themselves a national assembly. They will appoint a president and proclaim the independence of the Irish Republic. Of course, this means an inevitable collision with the large British force now in Ireland. This is exactly what the Sinn Féin is playing for. They are prepared for considerable sacrifices of life, so long as the fighting can take place when the Allied Conferences and Peace Congress are being held. Now, the word choice here obviously is very interesting. There's a clear implication that Sinn Féin is being portrayed as both bloodthirsty and cowardly, potentially wanting violence to occur during the same time frame as the Versailles Peace Conference. A few pages later in this same issue, de Valera's name was deliberately anglicized to Professor Edward de Valera. However, just two days later on January 3rd, 1919, the Gazette took a notably more sympathetic tone with Irish revolutionaries, arguing that Britain, the mother of free peoples, the founder of free institutions, still holds Ireland by force of arms. A garrison greater than the two divisions which went overseas from Canada maintains the existence of the United Kingdom. Free speech, and the use of the Irish language have been banned by military proclamation, and a large number of the leaders of national thought and elected representatives of the people have been for many months in English pr prisons without trial or legal accusation. The fundamentals of the constitutional government have been violated, and the English press is silent. The column admonished Britain that, quote, she must clean the Algian stables of her own household before she gives any more time to those of the late Teutonic empires. Feelings about both the Ulster crisis and the Easter rising still carried a great deal of weight with the Gazette's presumed audience, or at least with its editors. Referring to unionist actions in Ulster, including the signing of the covenant and the raising of the UVF, the Gazette proposed that, quote, for this act of open and successful rebellion, their leader, Sir Edward Carson, was rewarded with a portfolio in the British cabinet while 14 of the young leaders of the Easter Rising, some of them less than 21 years of age, but all animated by that love which has been glorified from time immemorial as the loftiest of human emotions, paid the supreme penalty before a British firing squad. Harry Trihe's 1917 comments received a new polish when the same article offered that, quote, Irishmen and the men of Irish descent in Canada have repressed their natural feelings and have helped in the prosecution of the war for more than four years, during which time they have witnessed with growing irritation a systematic propaganda through the press against their mother country, which it would appear is to be the foundation upon which the champion of small nationalities is to build her justification for the refusal of freedom to the nation which has grown ever smaller and weaker through all the generations of her struggle, since the days of the penal laws and the long succession of malignant cruelties of later times. Given this moderately pro Sinn Féin opinion in the newspaper at the very start of the year, you would be forgiven for feeling a bit of whiplash from the very next day's content. On January 4th, the front page declared that Sinn Féiners will provoke and welcome constant conflicts with the government and endeavor to make the government's administration difficult. Now, what I find interesting here is the editorial decision to place this headline about an Irish desire to provoke conflict, which you can see there on the slide, immediately next to a list of Canadian war casualties. Is this layout meant to advance some kind of particular agenda? Is it to turn opinion against Sinn Féin or perhaps to stir up Canadian war fatigue less than two months after the armistice so that even those not necessarily personally affected by events in Ireland might want to avoid any Canadian involvement in another war? Or was it simply the layout editor found an appropriate space for the box of casualty figures and used it without any ulterior motive? 
again, this is uh, really when I wish I had the other two Anglophone newspapers uh, for comparison. Nearly two years later, the Gazette had taken a serious interest in consistently providing reports on the violence in Ireland. The burning of Cork received a great deal of attention in early December 1920, often juxtaposed with reports of de Valera's progress through the United States. In the majority of the articles, the Gazette's coverage now veered towards a pro-British stance, or at least an anti-de Valera one. For instance, when describing an attack of Sinn Féin rioters on the Union Club in New York City, the Gazette proposed that the event might, quote, mark the beginning of a new and better appreciation of Sinn Féin activities on the part of the American public. The paper then argued that pro-Republican sentiment in the United States had allowed the active agents and sympathizers of Sinn Féin to, quote, carry on their agitation and promote their propaganda with ease and without opposition. De Valera was a common target for the paper's derision. Here you can see Mr. De Valera himself has incurred a certain amount of ridicule by reason of the patent fact that contrary to his promise, he has outlived the late Lord Mayor McSweeney of Cork, and there exists a suspicion that McSweeney was the more real patriot of the two, the explanation being perhaps that he was an Irishman, which de Valera is not. This was not the only time the Gazette questioned de Valera's Irishness between 1919 and 21, although this example was perhaps its most blatant attempt to other him. As the Gazette became more vocally anti-Republican, if still cautiously pro-independence, Direct attacks on de Valera's heritage allowed the paper to lament a figure like Terence McSweeney without necessarily endorsing an anti-British political position. At the beginning of 1921, there was yet another discernible change in the paper's outlook. On January 3rd, the Gazette's front page commentary was highly critical of Crown forces in Ireland. A special cable to both the Gazette and the New York Times read, well, we wish to avoid making any general accusation against a body of men with so distinguished a record as the Royal Irish Constabulary, we feel compelled to express our opinion based on our personal observations that a by no means negligible proportion of the force is at present constituted as men of intemperate habits and utterly unsuited to their duties. It may be that not more than 1% of the IRIC, sorry, RIC men are men of really bad character. Nevertheless, this small fraction has discredited, discredited the whole force as an instrument of policy by making it the object of general dread and detestation. Evidence in support of this statement was found in every di district visited, though in some, a distinction was made between members of the old constabulary and the black and tans. In Tralee, the auxiliaries enjoyed a reputation for good behavior and moderation among the inhabitants, but in other districts which we, we visited, they inspired terror. End quote. The article then continued that the IRA was fed and harbored by people who only three years before had certainly not been Sinn Feiners, and some of whom in fact had been unionists. Quote, so great has been the provocation by the forces of the crown that 80% of Irish men and women now regard the shooting of policemen and throwing bombs at lorries with the same philosophic resignation that Lloyd George displays toward arson, pillage, and shooting of civilians at sight in the presence of their wives and children. Under such conditions, it is practically impossible to bring the Irish Republican army to bay. The policy of reprisals by destruction, if carried to its ultimate conclusion, will ruin Ireland outside of Ulster, but it will not be the volunteers." End quote. Violence against Irish women during the revolutionary period, which is a topic that has received a great deal of more recent attention through the work of Linda Connolly, Susan Byrne and others, also appeared in the Gazette's reporting of early 1921, albeit in fairly veiled language. After detailing the physical beating a housewife had endured by the Black and Tans, the paper announced that, quote, this rough and brutal treatment of women is by no means the worst that is to be said against men in the service of the British Crown. It is, however, extremely difficult to obtain direct evidence of incidents affecting females, for the women of Ireland are reticent on sub, sub, such subjects, end quote. The rest of the column then proceeds to recount the events of Bloody Sunday before pronouncing that Croke Park was a ghastly tragedy resulting from official errors of judgment and incompetence. However, the entire report ends not with a denunciation of British policies because of their violence or their cruelty, 
but because the paper believed those actions had violated British values and the honor of the empire. We cannot close this report without an appeal to the British labor movement and to the British public. Things are being done in the name of Britain, which must make her name stink in the nostrils of the whole world. The honor of our people has been greatly compromised. Not only is there a reign of terror in Ireland, which should bring a blush of shame to every British citizen, but the nation is being held in subjection by the empire which has proudly boasted that it is the friend of small nations. It's important to note that this cable was primarily written for an American audience through the New York Times, but the fact that it was the report chosen to be reprinted in the Gazette might suggest that the editorial staff wanted to endorse this scathing point of view on the war for Montreal readers, that Irish freedom was paramount in light of the atrocities committed by Crown forces. I began today with Harry Trahi, and I'm going to end with a surprise find from the Gazette's coverage in 1920, another interview that he gave three years after his controversial article had appeared in the Evening Post. On the 22nd of April, 1920, Trahi discussed the formation of a new Irish-Canadian National League in Montreal. The Irish-Canadian feels the present position in Ireland most intensely, he said, and I have no hesitation in saying that the general public ought to be interested in and ought to be informed of the attitude of the Canadians of Irish blood to the present situation. We believe that all peoples have a right to determine the form of government under which they should live, and as we believe that Ireland is a nation, then we hold she should have that right. Now, in many ways, this was really a direct continuation of Trahi's earlier thoughts on the rights of small nations and the removal of the British from Ireland. A key difference in this commentary, however, is that in 1920, Canada was no longer at war and any public expression of his opinions no longer carried a threat of sedition charges. Trahi directly addressed the issue of a future Irish Republic. The statement of Lloyd George, he wrote, that if the Irish people were asked what form of government they desire to live under, they would emphatically declare for a republic and independence, should not, in my opinion, affect the support of Canadians of Irish blood might give. If Ireland has the right in principle, then the choice she might make if accorded that right should not and would not affect their support. He also addressed the imperial angle for Irish Canadians, continuing, as citizens of one of the associated nations of the British Commonwealth, they believe it would be more in the interests of the Commonwealth that Ireland should not form part of it rather than be kept within it under the prevailing conditions. Echoing his 1917 statement, Trihe also doubled down on his belief that Canadians of Irish heritage were first and foremost Canadians and that their opinions about Ireland could only be those of outsiders. The basic principle of any Irish Canadian National League, he argued, is, quote, that Canada comes first and last, and its only relation to Ireland is that of a sister nation with which members have a special blood sympathy. There are many similarities between Trihe's comments in 1917, after the rising but before the beginning of the War of Independence, and those he provided in 1920. These later comments were given before Bloody Sunday, and before the Gazette seemingly endorsed a more pro-independent tone by early 1921. Certainly, Trahi's opinions still mattered. He had remained a very popular figure in Irish Montreal and across the rest of the country, thanks in no small part to his continuing status as a hockey legend. Some things in Canada never change. His war experiences, including his disgust over the breaking of the Irish Canadian Rangers, his notable success as a lawyer in Montreal, and his position as a highly respected member of the Irish Catholic community up until his death in 1942, gave him credit with the press and the elites of the city and the province that few others enjoyed. It is not at all surprising that the Gazette returned to him in 1920 after running his Evening Post article in 1917. And it will be very interesting to see when I can get to the archives again, how the other newspapers in Montreal positioned his comments or if they even gave him a platform at all. As for the Gazette, its coverage of the Irish War of Independence continued throughout 1921. When possible, it tried to position the Irish in Montreal as a singular community, which it never was, that ultimately wished to see Ireland have the same freedoms that Canada enjoyed, a repetition really of the Dominion status template. 
To that end, it announced that a group of citizens of Montreal of both sexes and representative of the various elements of civic life have formed a committee with the purpose of collecting funds for the relief of distress in Ireland. What views are held as to the causes of the present troubles and the degree of blame to be attached to the contending forces, there can be no two opinions as to the distress which now prevails over the greater part of the country. The suffering that follows in the wake of war falls alike upon all parties and upon all creeds. In the devastated areas, Protestant and Catholic, Unionist and Republican have been afflicted equally wherever their homes stood in the path of the devouring flames. The humanitarian impulse should know no distinction of race or creed. And as in the case of Belgium, the movement for relief is spreading over all parts of the empire. Interestingly, Harry Trihe's name was missing from the list of prominent Montrealers who were part of this committee. And one can only imagine what he made of that particular reference, once again, to the rights of small nations. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Jane. Um, and, um, it's interesting that Henry Tri Harry Trihe's name was not on that list. I was just thinking as you were, uh, as you were coming to your conclusion uh, that neither is uh, his name in the secret police files uh, mm. from that period, which are very good for Montreal, um, mm. for 1920, um, and which have a lot of information about the uh, Sinn Féin revolutionary underground and its connection with socialist groups, trade union groups uh, in Montreal, and uh, the activities that they, they were doing, how they were actually using the funds that were being collected, so for, for gun running, uh, essentially. Mm. That's how you're re relieving the distress uh, in Ireland. Of course, it all depends on your definition of the distress, you know. Exactly. Uh, but one of the things, is, just before we get to the, uh, to the chat uh, questions, um, one, I realize that, that owing to COVID restrictions, you've not been able to do as much research as you would like, but have you, um, have you been able to uh, discover very much about the, the connection between Trahi's uh, Irish Canadian National League um, and the SDIL, the social, uh, sorry, the uh, uh, Self-Determination for Ireland League, and particularly uh, the collapse of the former into the latter? I haven't yet, but it's it's something that I'm I'm wanting to really follow up because what what I found when I was beginning to to gather some of the research was that this is a period that really hasn't been covered by anyone yet. That you know, Robin Burns' article only covers the war years, and Matthew Barlow's work, which is fantastic on Griffintown and Irish Montreal, also skips from about 1918, early 1919, um, until the 1930s. Um, so. In terms of primary evidence, I, I have yet to, to really be digging into a lot of it, but it's it's something that I think will be fascinating to start to unearth. Right, it's something that, that uh, could be followed up with uh, Simon Jolivet's uh, book. Of course, yeah, yeah Liberia, a few references Liberia. to yeah. it, but, uh, but, but again, they're tantalizing ones. It'd be very interesting to, to dig deeper into mm -hmm. that. Uh, moving to the chat here, uh, if I can get into it. Um, the second, it seems to be eluding me. <laughs> okay, got it. Um, all right, uh, Jane, your your team loyalties are well chosen. I, I don't know. I don't know who could possibly have written that. Uh, not not a real hockey fan, I'm sure. Uh, <laughs> uh, Shane, Shane, Lee. oh, this is on De Valera uh, and uh, uh, the the comments that De Valera was not really Irish. A Sydney newspaper at the same time described De Valera as a half breed Mexican. And Porrigo Shield chimes in, Dev, the illegitimate son of a Spanish Jew. Uh, boy, anyone studying uh, the connection between uh, racism and nationalism in Ireland could certainly pay attention to those statements and should pay attention to them. Um, and uh, from Shane, thanks for a great presentation. Have you found anything yet uh, about Trihe's later career or his position on the Anglo-Irish Treaty? Uh, his later career, uh, he was involved with the uh, Harbour Commission in Montreal, um, and he remained a, a very well-respected lawyer um, and, and really became one of um, sort of the, the Westmount regulars. Um, his daughter's wedding is covered in the Gazette in the early 1930s. Um, he himself, his, his house on, on the boulevard, which 
I'm trying to think of my Toronto comparison. Westmount, I think, would kind of be like Rose, Rosedale or Forest Hill, sort of the, the very elite neighborhood. Um, and uh, to be on the boulevard is now considered, you, you, you've really made it. If you're above the boulevard, then, then you have more millions than you want to disclose. Um, his house had actually burned down um, while he had been away during the war. And so they had to rebuild it from scratch. Um, and after that, he became really involved in, in sort of local Westmount affairs. I've heard a rumor, which I need to follow up, that um, there could be more on him in the Westmount Library, uh, but it is still under uh, COVID restrictions in terms of access. You can get your books, but you can't spend much time in terms of uh, being in the actual building. So um, so we know a bit about him and he, he was then a, a very um, well-loved figure chosen for the Hockey Hall of Fame uh, when it was established. Um, I think he has something like honored status within it. I'm not, I don't know what the rankings within the Hall of Fame, but it, he's certainly within it. Um, I don't know his feelings on the treaty, but again, that's something that I'm, I'm hoping might be picked up um, in uh, newspapers beyond what I looked at. Um, and uh, perhaps also something like the Montreal Herald, which was more of a, certainly a pro-British paper for much of its existence. And so I'd be very interested to see what they made of Trihe's comments, both in 1917 and 1920, um, to see him as more perhaps of a divisive figure. Um, the fact that he wasn't on that final committee to, to aid in distress, um, the people who were listed on it were Lord Shaughnessy and a number of different uh, bishops and ministers. Um, some women were actually on the list, which was also a, a surprise when I found them, uh, but not Trihe. So I, I don't know quite what to make of that yet. All right, thank you very much. Um, plaudits from Richard Carter, who uh, unfortunately has to leave, but uh, really enjoyed your talk and Mark's talk. Um, from Sean O'Shea, has there been much study of the intersection of Irish Canadian sporting teams and their involvement in the First World War? From a high level search of Toronto newspapers, mentions of Gaelic game teams in the city seem to disappear after 1914. And I wonder, uh, was this impacted by recruitment into the war? Paul Rouse at Trinity College Dublin has written about the war and the GAA in Ireland. I know that um, that Matthew Barlow had written on um, certainly the shamrocks and pre-war uh, forms of, of masculinity. Um, I think he calls it actually scientific aggression at one point in the title. Um, and a lot of the recruiting posters for the Irish Canadian uh, Rangers really focused on um, having local sports clubs being uh, able to sign up together, uh, which was something as well that, that mimicked a lot of the recruiting in, in some of the early Irish uh, divisions in 1914. Um, but I'm not sure about the Toronto angle. Uh, Mark or David might, might have more of an insight on that. Um, I, I would say uh, Mark can pick up on the war itself, but um, a, a footnote to that that you might be interested in, Sean, is that uh, in the Bureau of Military History, you'll find Online, uh, you'll find uh, the uh, the reminiscences of Patrick Rankin uh, from County Louth, and um, he was a house painter uh, and an IRB member who came to Toronto in 1913, and uh, he was pretty much appalled by what he found here. Uh, there was no IRB or organization; it was the ancient order of Hibernians, but uh, they weren't radical enough for him. Um, but he did organize Gaelic games uh, while he was here. He was only here for a few months and uh, he found the atmosphere too suffocating and skedaddled to the more con congenial territory of Philadelphia. Um, but uh, he organized Gaelic games um, at Christie Pitts. Uh, so there's some examples of that. And just as a, a, a give that some more context, one of the things that um, that I discovered when I was working on the Fenians in Toronto in the 1860s, uh, indeed from 1859, was that they used sports uh, to recruit people. Uh, perhaps there's nothing particularly surprising about that. I mean, it happened in Ireland as well. But they used rowing, uh, they used uh, hurling, and they used Gaelic football uh, to bring people into the Hibernian Benevolent Society. Uh, many of the leading figures in those sports organizations were Fenians. Um, Mark, over to you. There's all okay uh, comments. Um, 
there's um, a master's thesis written at uh, Mark, would you like to come in directly rather? Sure, than yeah, there was a master's thesis written at uh, McMaster and for the life of me, it's sitting on my shelf in my office, not here in the Hobbit Hole in Whitby. Um, but it uh, tracks Irish sport in Toronto from the mid uh, 19th century to the to the early 20th. Um, the, the fellow um, consulted with me. He also told me that St. Michael's was the first place in Toronto actually to, to play rugby, um, which of course is a garrison game, but uh, nonetheless, uh, uh, that's in the thesis. Um, there was a sportsman battalion raised in Toronto, uh, tapping local rowing and other athletic clubs in the city. And uh, I did, when I was doing research at Concordia uh, some time ago for Imperial Irish, I was going through the Hingston papers. Hingston, of course, was was the chaplain in chief assigned to, to the 199th uh, and uh, a Jesuit. And uh, some of his correspondence, they regret the loss of, of athletes and other leaders um, to recruitment, not that they were against recruitment, but they noticed that the the ranks of the sports teams at, at uh, Loyola in Montreal had, you know, seriously depleted over the war years. But uh, yeah. All right. Thank you very much, Mark. Do we have any more um, comments or questions? David, Sean yes. Conway, just on that oh. sports reference, I think, uh, Mark, we think we're looking, is it not Kevin Walmsley and Dennis Ryan? I think they certainly they, have they, they, Yeah, Dennis Ryan was the one, yeah. Yeah. All right, thank you, Sean. And finally, I will not, I will not murder the language here, or which I would if I tried to speak it, but go. Even something as simple as that. Uh, but to, thank you very much for your comments. That's very, very good of you. Uh, much appreciated, uh, and indeed. Uh, through about Kitchener and Berlin. Um, at this at this point, um, I'll I'll make some some general comments. I won't detain you for too long. Um, afterwards, uh, I will invite you uh, to join us. Uh, for, there's going to be a a, a breakout breakout room, but we can those of you who wish to stick around are very welcome to do so. Um, the the uh, contributors are going to open up uh, some wine or beer. Um, we will, yes, thank you, Pa. God knows I need it. Uh, <laughs> all I know is the Ulster, uh, so I'll say that. But um, uh, clearly I'm overdue. Uh, but uh, we'll stick around for a, a few drinks and a few laughs. And for those of, those of us who haven't seen each other in a long while, it'd be great to reconnect. For those of you who are coming here for the first time, it would be lovely to meet you, albeit virtually. So uh, we'll be doing that uh, uh, for a while. Um, meanwhile, some general comments. I'd like to I'd like to go right back to the beginning and uh, Dara's initial comments about the global context and about biography, uh, because it's clear from everything we've heard today uh, that uh, the global context and the way in which it intersects. Uh, with specific Irish Canadian experiences, uh, it's absolutely crucial here. Um, and, um, and and taking the Irish Revolution off the island, uh, which is certainly uh, the way it was taught when I uh, first went into Irish history, taking it off the island and looking at it within the global context and looking at it from the perspective of Toronto and Montreal and Vancouver. Uh, rather than simply the perspective of Dublin or Cork or Belfast. I think it's a very, very valuable approach. Um, and I think, uh, Dara, you're all, you know, I like the fact that you uh, highlighted biography in this, because, of course, that is, that is the way we're approaching this topic through the lives of, and experiences of, uh, of five remarkable individuals, uh, remarkably energetic, remarkably powerful uh, individuals, uh, now, there is, um, speaking as a general editor of the Dictionary of Canadian Biography, there, there's a downside to that as well. I think we need to be aware of. There are dangers as well as strengths in focusing on uh, biography because we could go away uh, from what we've heard with um, a somewhat distorted view, I think, of overall Irish-Canadian responses uh, to uh, the, the Irish Revolution. Um, we must remember, I think, that uh, Lindsay Crawford um, 
fascinating and in many ways appealing an individual as he is, um, was not typical of or representative of um, Ulster or Irish Canadian Protestants, quite the reverse, in fact. Uh, so I think we must bear that in mind, just as Catherine Hughes um, uh, probably alienated uh, more Irish Catholic Canadians than she attracted, although one could debate that. Osmond Esmond, what can one say? I mean, I see the pictures of Osmond Esmond and I think we have um, a film star before the time of films. I mean, this with his wit, his humor, his monocle, his bow tie, uh, 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 his sheer presence. Um, but again, uh, while it's a very colorful and in many respects instructive story, um, uh, Osmond Esmond ultimately was Osmond Esmond. Having said that though, it strikes me that um, that he, he can be located within a strand of Irish nationalism, perhaps more easily than Catherine Hughes and Lindsay Crawford can be uh, located within Irish Canadian uh, national, the more moderate forms of Irish Canadian nationalism. Osmond Esmond, I think, can be located in the strand of Irish nationalism that runs from Sinn Féin through to the blue shirts. Um, one could also perhaps, although he wasn't a member of Sinn Féin, um, uh, locate William Butler Yeats within that strand as well, uh, given his uh, flirtation with the blue shirts uh, and the uh, and admiration for um, Mussolini as well. Um, uh, I, sus I think uh, John Joseph O'Gorman did uh, uh, reflect more uh, Irish Canadian views um, uh, and that sort of that double duty, that uh, that sense that Ireland was only trying to get what Canada already had. Uh, I think that, uh, and, and we were fighting during the war for small nations, therefore, as Harry Trihe put it, that, that same view. Um, if, you, if you fight for, uh, for poor Belgium, uh, then you should fight for oppressed Ireland as well, uh, or you should support, not necessarily fight for oppressed Ireland, but you should support home rule for Ireland, give Ireland what Canada has. Um, this is, uh, I think, uh, one reason why O'Gorman admired Darcy McGee, because Darcy McGee's position consistently in Canada throughout his many inconsistencies was, if we can demonstrate in Canada uh, that when Irish Catholics are treated fairly, uh, when they are not ground down by landlords, when they are not ground down by a church establishment, supporting an established church to which they do not belong, um, uh, if they are treated fairly, they will be loyal. And if that is the case in Canada, uh, then that's what we must strive for in Ireland. So I think there's a resonance there as well. And Harry Trihe, I think, belongs to that tradition as well. Um, one final thought um, here um, is that the Celtic Studies program um, has uh, published or, or its conferences uh, have resulted in four uh, refereed published books uh, uh, on Ulster Scots, on the Orange Order, on Irish nationalism in Canada, uh, and on Irish and Scottish encounters with Indigenous peoples. It strikes me, listening to today's talks and the high quality of these talks, uh, that there's a book here as well. And uh, I think that that's something that uh, that we should seriously consider um, as we uh, move on before uh, beyond Saturday, October the 23rd, 2021. I thank you all very much uh, for coming out uh, and for your stickability uh, um, in, in an online conference, which is always appreciated. Uh, I've found it a, a really stimulating day and I very much hope that you have too. So, um, what I, what I suggest now is that we shut everything down for five, well, I'm going to mute and turn off my video for five minutes. I invite you to do the same if you like. We'll, I'm going to go and get myself a glass of wine. Feel free. This is a BYOB party. Uh, so uh, please feel free to join in. And if you have other, uh, uh, other uh, obligations, of course, that's no problem at all. Whatever works for you. Thanks very much. Thanks to all our speakers. Thanks again to uh, Sheila, uh, Sheila Eaton for designing the poster, uh, for Jean Tallman, 
as always, uh, where would we be without Jean Tormann uh, for all the work that she does on behalf of Celtic Studies and specifically for this conference? And finally, Natalie, thank you so much. I did not realize you were the granddaughter of such an illustrious Irish Canadian uh, until this morning, but thank you so much uh, for making sure that this was a smoothly run conference without any technical glitches. Uh, we owe you. All right. Thank you. And uh, I'll be back in five minutes. Look forward to seeing you then. All the very Thank best. you, David. Thank you for everything you did today, David. Uh, you kept it running. So uh, our, our, our great uh, thanks to you. Okay. Thanks, Mark. All right. Cheers. Well done. Well done. Thank you. My heavens. All right, well, um, here we are. Natalie, uh, if you're still here, would you mind um, getting us off live on YouTube, please? Because this is just a chat among friends. Or should we go into the breakout room for that? I can see it. I see 